with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did fail her. We're supposed to, her. Yeah, we're supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good morning and welcome to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer and you're with Talk TV. We're on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. And I'm with you live from 10 until 1. Coming up in this hour, the data watchdog is investigating a major security breach to Princess of Wales after reports that staff at her private hospital tried to gain unauthorised access to her medical records. This comes as new polling shows that over half the British public have seen conspiracy theories about her health. And government plans to house asylum seekers on barges and disused military bases could cost millions more than keeping them in hotels. That's according to a government watchdog report. This comes as the Archbishop of Canterbury, yeah, him again, has backed calls for asylum seekers to be allowed to work from the day they arrive in Britain. Deep size, everyone. And a new bill making it illegal for anyone born after January 2009, so age 14 this year, to ever buy cigarettes will be introduced to Parliament today. I'd love to know what you think of that. First, though, let's get the latest news headlines with Emily Rose Adams. Good morning. UK inflation has fallen to its lowest level for two and a half years. Figures from the Office for National Statistics show that the price of goods and services fell to 3.4% in February, down from 4% in January, and it's the lowest since September 2021. Meanwhile, tomorrow, the Bank of England's widely expected to hold interest rates at 5.25%. Danny Houston, the head of financial analysis at AJ Bell, has told Talk TV it's a positive sign. Yeah, it is good news. Um, we were expecting 3.5%. Remember, it held firm at 4% last month, which sort of set things on a bit of a wobble with lots of people maybe thinking that interest rates, those crucial Bank of England rates, might not fall as far and as fast as we had been thinking. So, yeah, 3.4%. It is the lowest level in over two years. Bosses at a hospital where the Princess of Wales was treated have launched an investigation following claims that staff tried to access her private medical records. The security breach happened at the London Clinic in January while she was a patient undergoing surgery there. The hospital is known for treating politicians and celebrities. And the data watchdog is now assessing the report. Our Royal Editor Sarah Hewson's told us the claims today are a huge concern. But this is extremely serious if these allegations are true, uh, because what is claimed is that a member of staff or several members of staff tried to access the Princess of Wales's private medical information during her 13-day stay at the London Clinic following abdominal surgery. Now, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you're a member of the royal family or if you are you know, the most famous person in the world, you are still entitled to medical privacy. Greg's stores across the UK are closed due to an IT issue which is affecting card payments. In a statement, the bakery chain added, we're working to resolve this as soon as possible. It follows card payment outages at Sainsbury's and Tesco on Saturday and McDonald's last Friday. 22% of police officers are planning to resign in the next two years, up from 18% the previous year. The Police Federation of England and Wales said 85% of those polled said they're not fairly paid given the dangers they face in the job, with 15% saying they'd suffered one or more injuries in the past year. More than 9,000 left the service in the year to March 2023. Well, former Met Police detective Peter Blexley says it's a perfect storm that will affect the force significantly. As much as they're trying to shovel brand new officers in through the front door, officers are leaving through the back door, not only because of pay, but because they're poorly trained, so they're not, they're not ready to fight crime when they get onto the front line. There's no experience to show them how to do it. The supervision and management is awful a lot of the time. And, of course, morale is absolutely on the floor. 
The National Audit Office has revealed it is in fact cheaper to house asylum seekers in hotels than in any of the government's planned alternatives. The Home Office wants to put them in barges and former RF bases, but apparently it will cost the taxpayer £46 million more. And broadcaster Tony Blackburn will be made an OBE in a ceremony at Windsor Castle today. The 81-year-old presenter has appeared on BBC and commercial radio stations for nearly six decades and became the first DJ on BBC Radio 1 when it launched in 1967. He'll be honoured for his services to broadcasting and to charity. That's the latest. Now time for a look at today's weather with Nazlin Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello, mild for many this afternoon. Sunshine for some, mainly across Scotland and Northern Ireland, but for others it's generally looking quite cloudy and rainy, mainly across Northern England into the Midlands, Eastern England, Wales and the West Country into this afternoon. Down towards the South East, there should be some good amounts of sunshine and it will be mildest there with temperatures locally up to 17 degrees Celsius, but also feeling pleasantly mild across parts of the North with the light winds and the sunshine for Scotland and Northern Ireland, where we'll probably see highs of around 12. Now, overnight, that front of rain will continue its journey further south and eastwards, most of it turning light and patchy in nature. It will be a mild, cloudy night across parts of central, southern and eastern England with mist and murk forming. Clear spells further north and west before more wind and rain spreads to the far northwest of Scotland and Northern Ireland with severe gales likely then. It will be a cool night across parts of the north. And then over tomorrow we will continue to see that rain spread its way further eastwards across Scotland with some heavy downpours across the high ground of the west, Northern Ireland and the Republic becoming wet and Northern England later too. But the rest of England and Wales will be mostly fine and bright and feeling mild in the south. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good morning and welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley-Brewer and you're with Talk TV. Joining me to run through all of the biggest stories of the day is Conservative commentator Benedict Spence. Good morning to you. Good morning. Um, lots to talk about. Let's get straight to it. Kate Data Breach, this is the Princess of Wales. Uh, an urgent probe has been launched by the Data Watchdog uh, into the hospital where she was treated for abdominal surgery and spent 13 nights. The London Clinic, used by the Royals, American presidents and ex-presidents because of the privacy issue there. That's, that's the key thing. I question at the time, what's wrong with the NHS for royals? No, this is all about privacy. Well, that turns out not to have uh, been the case. It's understood that staff tried to, we don't know if it's one member of staff or more than one, tried to access her medical files, but clinic bosses refused to reveal how long they've known, bearing in mind this surgery back in January, or if anyone has actually been sacked. How serious is this? I mean, it's serious, I suppose, that somebody might try. Uh, it slightly defeats the purpose of this, uh, of this facility if, you know, its whole thing is about privacy to then say, ah, oh, but at the drop of a hat, it, because somebody's decided to take an interest, a member of staff might do it. You'd have thought that they would vet them very carefully for people who wouldn't I think you can vet people thing. very, very carefully, but it depends how much money is available. Well, now, there's was, no way yeah. in the world the British media, the print media, the broadcasters, could use any information that was... Mm. Uh, uh, got got to in that way. However, we know, as with like you know the long lens pictures of her sunbathing topless in yep. a private villa and things like that, those things do have a habit of ending up on on websites around the world. And then, of course, the British media will report it as mm. it's being reported that etc cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, I'm amazed whenever I've said this every time we talk about this on the show. Get attacked? Like, don't you know? Stop attacking Kate. I'm not attacking her. I would never dream. I don't want to know. I don't care. Let the mm. poor woman, you know recuperate in peace. I just think the palace has handled this so badly and it would appear so has the hospital because I imagine huge, it wouldn't just be interest. I mean, there'll be mm. staff members who go, I'm just going to have a quick sneaky look. Yeah. Well, of course, there's a record of whoever looks at any files. I'm assuming that they have some files which have, you know, extra extra security around them, one would assume. Mm. Um, but, um, but, 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 you know, th th clearly, they're clearly, you know, even the people at the hospital aren't on, on top of this stuff. Well, as you say, there is a huge audience and therefore an appetite now, I think, for people to try and find out whatever information they can. I mean, you see that sort of with the, uh, with the sort of the, <laughs> the, 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 the breadth of the conspiracy theories that, that there are swelling around them. People, I understand your point, people will pay money to find out what's going on with her. Yep. Uh, but ultimately, it is, you're right, it, it, 
It is frankly a bit disgraceful that you know people are sort of trying to pry so desperately. I, I mean, get stay that it's, classy, people. Yeah, I get that it's very sort of interesting because of the air of mystery and all that, and I get that people are obsessed with the and rules. And you must have I don't people messaging. Why. I have people messaging me all the time. What's the real story? What's the real story? I, I, I as do. If, as if we're I, all keeping. I, I do uh, you get know, people as... messaging me. There, there was a joke going around on, on X or Twitter or whatever we called that everybody is texting their poshest friend right now because that's the person. Do you know? Likely. Do you know something? Um, yeah. I, I was actually rather flattered by some of the people that were texting thinking, me, thinking they knew, thinking you might. No. But no. yeah, we are talking about it. it's clearly, I mean, if you're in hospital for 13 nights, it's clearly serious surgery. Yeah. They wanted to keep it private. Long recuperation, yes, we've got pictures around about it. We've talked mm. about those yesterday uh, on front of the sun and in you know, a video. And 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 lots of people say that's not Kate. And the, <laughs> so nothing seems to have quelled these mm. these uh, these reports. A fascinating study, also a, a river survey showing that um basically you know, half of us have seen reports of uh of, of these conspiracy theories and, and things and, and of course that's that's fooling it. Maybe we're making it worse by talking about it. Uh, we are going to be talking to um, royal experts uh, throughout the show. Uh, mm -hmm. We're going to talk to former press secretary to the late Queen, Simon Lewis, in the next hour as well to ask his thoughts about, you know, how you do actually deal with these sorts of things. Talking of data breaches, mm -hmm. talking of computer... These, this will be computer records. Uh, also, I mean, big news this morning, Greg's... Uh, are, are having troubles with their computers. They're, they're unable to, uh, I think, you know, deal with their uh, take a ca um, card payments and the like. I mean, mm. They're dishing out a few sausage rolls for free, so that's quite good news. This comes after, I mean, IT problems at Greg's, Tesco, Sainsbury's, Argos and McDonald's. I mean, let's chase it. If this is Vladimir Putin behind all this, he knows how to hit it where hit us where it hurts, doesn't he? <laughs> There is fast this, food, fast that, food, yeah. and cheap goods. There is this idea that it is all to do with hacking, that is foreign actors hacking, and that is entirely possible. But there is, I'm afraid, actually a, a slightly uh, more worrying concern, and that is that there is just a lack of relative competence as systems become more complex and companies seek ever more to cut costs because, yeah. as we all know, the economic situation is not very good. Actually, it becomes much more difficult to keep these things online. Twitter is a very good example. Uh, no, of this. I, think, I think I think this many attacks on mm. major companies that we've seen. Look, we've seen you know the, the NHS having a yeah. cyber attack a few years ago and big banks whenever a big bank goes down i'm sorry that's a cyber attack is what it is sometimes it is not a, i i genuinely and i think that it's a bit like when people blame the cl climate crisis for flooding because nobody's dredged the rivers it's very easy to say ah it's vladimir putin that it's always behind very often it is but sometimes i'm afraid to say it is because somebody has messed up somewhere and ultimately it comes yeah. down to the decisions made by a company to hire or to sack certain people they have underqualified people their systems are very archaic or they've yeah. been updated and the people are not trained on them i'm afraid that is just yeah. as likely well my husband's in it so actually most of these it glitches or when there's a cyber security mm. thing is actually always down to one one member of staff <laughs> Who's, who's answering an email on their laptop or their phone at home and hasn't gone through all the, the, ba the basic rules. They're just not obeying the rules that are put in place. It's a Homer um, Simpson spilling his coffee on something. Yeah, it, it is that, that sort of level, situation. isn't it? Um, I want to talk about what's going on with the Rwanda bill mm. again. <laughs> Speaking of things that don't I, work. I genuinely, I can imagine I'm going to be 80 years old going, let's talk about the Rwanda bill. Do you think any flights will ever take off? I don't know what that accent was, that voice was. But uh, let's also talk about smoking. Um, this smoking ban announced by the Prime Minister, as he still is, I've just checked before we came on air, mm. Rishi Sunak at the Tory conference last uh, autumn. Um, but the bill to actually introduce that smoking ban uh, and, and, and uh, limits on vaping as well is also uh, involved. He's introducing that new bill to the Commons today. Basically, anyone aged 14 or younger this year mm. will never be able to legally buy cigarettes. We've also got bans on disposable vapes and, and on some of the flavours which are most enticing for children. But particularly on the ban on legally buying cigarettes in a few years' time, basically, you know, if you, even if you're an adult, you could be with someone who is one day older than you who mm. could go in and buy a packet of cigarettes. You can't go and do that. Do you agree or disagree with this ban? I want to know whether you do or you don't. Do you think it's too nanny state? Do you think it's the right thing to do for our health? I mean, these are these are cancer sticks, are they not? Uh, tell us why you agree. Tell us why you disagree. Uh, get in touch uh, on 0344 499 1000. I'd love to get your calls on this. Text on 87222 or get in touch on X at Talk TV. Calls are charged at the national rate. Text costs one standard network rate message. Benedict, have you ever smoked and would you support this ban? Uh, I've smoked occasionally. I do still smoke the occasional cigar. I do 
don't, I, I don't uh, uh, support this ban. I don't think there's much point to it. I think that given the lengths that people will go to to uh, distribute illegal drugs that are much more severe than, yeah. than uh, tobacco and the nicotine that comes with it, this is a really low-hanging fruit for criminal organisations. But hold on a minute, no, but they make a lot of money, money from... I mean, there's, a, there's, you know, the heroin, the cocaine, mm. they make a lot of dope, they make a lot more money from that. They um, can, you can make a huge amount of money from illegal cigarettes. cigarettes. They because already so do. many more people It's use also them. a fantastic means of smuggling other drugs around if it's hidden in a consignment of cigarettes that the average police officer is not going to go, oh, well, I'll wave it through because what's the fine for that? Yeah. It's very, as I say, low-hanging fruit. Because it's about 15, 16 quid to buy a packet of mm. cigarettes sort of, you know, legally now. But I understand that actually, you know, people are getting them, you know, off the back of a lorry uh, yeah. really quite openly now. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kingdom City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. Ooh, whoa, miss it. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know uh, it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. Yeah, we're that supposed to have was moved another on from that. era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer, and you are with Talk TV. Now, government plans to hassle asylum seekers on barges and disused military bases could cost more than keeping them in hotels, according to a government watchdog. Let's talk to former Conservative Government Minister, uh, Lord uh, Andrew Robethon, who joins us now. Uh, good morning to you. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. Um, now, the whole point of you know, moving people onto the baby Stockholm barge and, and, and requisitioning these older RAF barracks was because the outcry from the public, quite rightly, about the huge, huge millions, even billions in total sums of money being spent on housing, uh, house, high, asylum seekers and, uh, and uh, channel migrants in hotels, sometimes in four-star hotels. Uh, now, that's, I think, we pretty much has been ended. But it turns out, according to the National Audit Office, who've looked into the finances of this, um, that we are looking at a one2 billion pound cost of putting the accommodation into these barges or former RAF bases. And that's 46 million pounds more than using hotels. Um, does that surprise you? And does that suggest to you that we should be doing it anyway? Or should we go back to the hotels? Well, Julia, I would say that these are capital costs for doing up uh, decaying old bases. I should say that there was a, a camp in Folkestone uh, about three or four years ago where everybody complained that we were sending refugees and asylum seekers. Um, uh, they complained it wasn't up, it wasn't up to standards for them. Well, I stayed there when I was in the army, and of course it wasn't five star hotel, but it was perfectly adequate. Now we're spending capital costs on doing up some of these places, so they're relatively comfortable. But in the long term, if this continues in the long term, we hope it doesn't. It will be much cheaper, I'm sure, than spending money on expensive hotels. And the other big issue is that, of course, communities do not like having 
um, 100 or 200 uh, people from abroad, well, mostly young men, young men, young men exactly. uh, dumped on them. Yeah, I mean, that's the key thing, isn't it? It's what, what's the alternative and where do they go? Because we know that a lot of these barracks had to be done up because apparently they were good enough for our soldiers but not good yeah. enough uh, for the migrants because apparently those rules are different. But again, I think a lot of people watching this will be shouting at us both right now on the telly and the radio and saying... The answer is for these people, A, not to be here in the first place, B, to be processed much more quickly, only here for a matter of weeks or a couple of months, and then deported or assessed as being uh, here legally and allowed to get on with their lives here. Um, but we know that's not going to happen any time soon. Well, Julia, I agree with you, or A, B and C, but of course the government is trying today to push through its Rwanda policy. Now, the Rwanda policy is absolutely not perfect. Um, I don't think you'd start from here, as they used to say. But um, it's, deserved, it's designed to deter people from coming. And we need to deter people from coming in their home countries and whatever. Of course, many of these people are indeed genuine refugees and asylum seekers. But most of them are coming here for very understandable reasons <laughs> to um, lead a better life to a more prosperous country because they're coming from a country which is not prosperous and they will need a much better life here. And when they get here, they very often, if they're admitted to asylum, they very often bring very large extended families as well. And I'm sorry, we need to crack down this. We're trying like mad and we're thwarted every turn by, first of all, um, uh, the, the courts. Second of all, by, I'm afraid, uh, the opposition, the Labour Party and the Liberal Democrat Party who are voting against this whole time. And, you know, this is nonsense. We need to reform the law. And I'm afraid it's a bit late for this government. We need to reform the law and we need to stop people, as we're seeing on the screen now, being, being brought into this country and look at them, they're all young men uh, yeah. because they're coming here to better themselves. Who yeah. can blame them? No, that's the thing. I don't have any issues. I completely understand. It's just, sorry, we, we didn't say we, we wanted them. Now, we know the Archbishop of Canterbury has joined other faith leaders um, in a, a, a new report. I mean, again, it absolutely blows my mind that this man is so out of touch. This is Justin Welby. He's a uh, part of the Independent Commission on the Integration of Refugees, which is, you know, just Wokesville. Uh, and they're calling uh, for the reinstatement of a refugees minister in government. Of course they are. But he's joined by the chief rabbi um, uh, and, and cardinals and, uh, and also uh, uh, Sheikh Ibrahim Mogra as well, uh, on behalf of the, is of the, is the Islamic faith. But he thinks, he, along with these faith leaders, believe that we need a shake-up of what they call the broken asylum system, so that's good, they admit it's broken, but saying that migrants should be eligible to work in the UK pretty much almost immediately, and certainly after six months of waiting for an asylum decision, and given free English language lessons as soon as they arrive. I mean, this is madness, isn't it? This is basically saying, come on in. Um, Julia, I'm always delighted to speak to you because I agree with you about so much. Of course, the asylum, seeker is in, the asylum system is indeed broken because we're not operating properly, because we're constrained by laws, many of which were passed under the Blair government. And we need to sh sort out the asylum system, but not in this way. And I'm afraid Justin Welby, who I like and I think is a very good speaker, Justin Welby needs to look after the people of England rather than all the asylum seekers yeah. and refugees who want to come here, not because they're actually being persecuted or anything like that, but because they want to better themselves. Well, indeed. Uh, and that's why he's saying they should be allowed to work but, from the but day this they the arrive. Thing, I, I, you I, I, need but to the, sort this out. But, I mean, this report, including, you know, just, you know signatory to, to this is, is Justin Welby, is saying, basically, where we have a shortage of, of, of people available for certain jobs, that, that we should say, no, from day one, you can work in those jobs from day one. So you've got someone who's just got off, paid as people smuggler, travelled across Africa and Middle East, paid a people smuggler, three, four, five grand to get across, arrives in this country, probably without any documentation. Oh, we're short, we're short of care workers in the local care home for the elderly and the vulnerable and the disabled. Let's let him go and work there. Are these people out of their frigging minds? I couldn't have put it better myself. But <laughs> look, there's nine million or whatever number of people on out-of-work benefits or sickness benefits, economically, uh, inactive that should be working and that's where we need to tackle this issue but that, that's a separate issue yeah. frankly to the um the asylum shake-up uh, and look justin welby is very well meaning but let him stand up for the people of britain the yes. people that go to the church of england not for people that come here and then pretend they're converting or say they're homosexual yeah. because they say so they can't be sent back i mean all this is 
you and I both agree all this is complete nonsense. Indeed. I'm just finally, I just want to ask you about the Rwanda bill. Uh, ping pong in the House of Lords and the House of Commons is ongoing. Uh, the bill goes back to the House of Lords tonight that we understand appears they're going to try and reinstate some of those amendments they put in and that were defeated uh, on, I think, Monday by, by uh, MPs. It's going to keep going. That will delay the bill even more. Do you think just yes or no, Rwanda flight's going to take off at any point this year? I do think they will. Um, the Labour Party will probably vote against us this time and then drop their opposition, is my understanding. But look, these are very often lawyers who yeah. think they know better than the legislature because they're, they're influenced by the European Court or whatever it may be. We need to get away from the idea that we have the rule of lawyers. We have the rule of law. And Parliament is sovereign. And it really, it really upsets me to see bien passant, stupid people um, <laughs> saying, oh, well, we can't do this because... Uh, we don't do this sort of thing. I'm sorry. Get out there in the real world and see what real people are thinking. And most of the people in this country want to end illegal immigration and indeed end mass immigration as we have at the moment. Lord Reverton, pleasure to speak to you. Glad we've got some sensible people in the House of Lords. Thank you very much Thank indeed you. for joining us. Still with me is Benedict Spence. Just to, uh, your thoughts. Just first, really, I just want to ask you about Justin Welby. I think what we forget about Justin Welby is he doesn't necessarily care about people from the Middle East, Indian subcontinent or, or from North Africa. Actually, what he cares about are people from sub-Saharan Africa because that's where the majority of Christians in the world are coming from. Yeah. So if he's looking for the long-term benefits of the Church of England, ah, he wants lots of people from there. Self-interest for of course the Church just say, oh, let all of the Ghanaians and the Nigerians in, but none of the other people. So it has to be couched in the, well, you know, bring us all... But also, isn't it just against that virtue thing? Well, I'm a nice person, so this is what I think, as opposed to looking at the impact yeah. on other people who don't get a say. Again, and again, yeah. he's got a lovely big Lambeth Palace to live in. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, not, they're not all moving into his street, are no, they? And they I'm are. sorry, if you, again, if you've got a teenage daughter, you're going to have some strong views on this. I, I love the fact in America, all the uh, Republican sort of uh, southern state governors started shipping people, uh, the migrants coming over the border over to New York and to, and to yeah. Martha's Vineyard and all where the Democrats live and all the rich people go, oh, we, why are you so awful about immigrants? I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, but, they want to support them all, yeah. yeah. There you go. <laughs> and now, now deal with the issue of people who arrive illegally. Absolutely. And I think that that, that sort of out-of-touchness and that desire to just be seen as being nice, is uh, everybody wants to be nice, but sometimes you need to be firm to be kind to people. And that's what it comes down to when it comes well, to... Well, it depends who you want to be kind to. And the duty of Kelly, uh, the, the Archbishop, and indeed our government, should have, it should be to the British people. And it's not and fair foremost. to drain other countries of their young people. Good, That's not very good point indeed. Moving on now, though, let's talk about uh, yet more stories about Kate, uh, the Princess of Wales. A data watchdog is now investigating a major security breach for the Princess of Wales. This after reports that staff at her private hospital tried to gain unauthorised access to her medical records. This comes as new polling shows that over half the British public have seen conspiracy theories about her health. Joining me now is former press secretary to the late Queen and former director of communications at number 10 for Gordon Brown. That's Simon Lewis. Good morning to you, Simon. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm wondering, when you were working at Buckingham Palace, did you ever have to deal with the sort of furore that we are seeing over not just you know, the King's health, obviously, and the information having to be given out about his cancer treatment, but the, the conspiracy theories and the furore over the Princess of Wales having an operation going out of the, the public limelight for so long? Did you ever deal with anything of that ilk? Well, as you know, Julie, it was a long time ago, and 1998 to 2000, and what struck me about that time, it was completely dominated by newspapers, and you wrote for them. Uh, they were edited by people like Piers Morgan and my partner, David Yelland, in our podcast, and they sold millions and millions of copies. And so the whole royal world was covered by newspapers and television. And what we're now seeing is that that has exploded into the internet world. And as you rightly say, as a survey yesterday, saying that 50% of people surveyed had gone online to look at conspiracy theories. So people doing my job now at Buckingham Palace and Kensington Palace have a completely different beast to deal with. Yeah. And, and I do think... I was going to say, uh, like, even the 24-hour right news thing, made, made an issue, but 24-hour news became the problem, and then social media has made it, exacerbated it beyond anything else. It, it, exactly. And, and one of the judgments you always have to make in these situations is how far do you go to comment on speculation? I mean, just a very quick reminder, there were two statements, one about the princess's health, one about the king's health. Both of them were factually correct. They both came out at the same time, coincidentally. We have seen the king, and that's entirely right. We haven't seen the Princess of Wales. She is recovering. This extraordinary story, if true, is just another reminder, Julie, to me of what is going on with privacy. 
Why can't a member of the royal family expect to go to hospital, which is a traumatic time for anyone, and not have their records allegedly looked into? I, I just I just find this debate about privacy and where you should draw the line very difficult because I think people should be much more understanding, actually. Doesn't this uh, come about, though, as a result of effectively the sort of the, I suppose, the celebrification of the royal family, particularly the younger royals? We saw this with the you know, arrival of Meghan and the treatment of, of the royals as celebrities. People talk about as being royal fans. Um, and actually, when you do that, then you take away a little bit of the mystique. And also people have this thing where, well, I demand to see another picture of the, of, of, of the future queen. I, I see a picture every day. I haven't seen her for a while. Oh. What's going on? And that fuels it all. In terms of the palace's reaction to this news, it was, it was a, a scoop from the Mirror newspaper uh, that, that a staff had been, we don't know whether it's one member or more than one member, had been uh, trying to totally illegally and wrongly access uh, her private medical files in a hospital which is used by royals it was used by the king, used by you know, American presidents, uh, oh. because it's renowned for the privacy and the secrecy uh, and the protection that people have. Um, in terms of the palace reaction, they're saying, look, this is a matter for the hospital. But what, tell us, talk us through what would be going on behind the scenes in the palace? Well, by the way, they're right. It is a matter for the hospital. And as you say, it's got a fantastic reputation, this hospital, and, and, and deservedly so. Deservedly so. I, I suspect what's going on in the palace is what should be going on, which is a bit of longer-term planning, thinking, planning for when the Princess of Wales is able to be seen in public a bit more, planning for what she might do, planning for what she might say. Because I... I've always believed in these roles. You've got to try and think two or three steps ahead. And I'm certain that when we do see the Princess of Wales again and she says something, it's like everything will blow over. Yeah. Because the, the, the royal family has to be visible. And for whatever reason, emotional set of reasons, people do get very jumpy when they're not. As I say, I think it's completely legitimate. But I do think inside Kensington Palace and Buckingham Palace, they'll be thinking, how do we move this on? Prince William's out doing his work in Sheffield with homelessness. I mean, there's a there's an agenda of of interesting issues for the royal family. So, but of course, it's a smaller royal family yeah. than when you and I and first so, knew each and other. And it's that, more noticeable, yeah, exactly. When when one of well, two of the major of the major figures, the most popular figures, are are actually out of action. Um, do you think though? Look, yes. you know, you you as you said, you do a podcast. You you know, you give advice to people. You used to advise to advise a prime minister. You used to give advice uh, to the late queen. Do you not think that palace flunkies? have flunked this time round by thinking they were ever going to be able to get through all of these months without people starting these conspiracy theories, without people trying to attempt to find out what was going on. And that, look, you and I, and I think most of my audience would be saying, look, the poor woman, she's had some serious surgery, obviously, she was in hospital for 13 nights, she's recuperating, oh. we don't know what it is. We don't need to know what it is. We don't need to know what every single person we've ever seen on telly has, has got in their terms of their private medical situation. We're not trying to find out, but other people are. But to not, for the palace funkies not to have thought, people are going to try and find this out. People are going to start theories. We need to handle this in advance. Would you have handled this yeah. differently? Well, I've, I've no idea. And by the way, I wasn't a flunky. I don't think they are. <laughs> not, not you, Simon. You were very senior. <laughs> you may have thought I was a flunky, but I thought, I mean, actually, these are serious people. These are serious advisors. And the challenge you have when you're in that role is exactly the same thing. You've got people in public life and people who have families and family lives. And this is always a delicate balance. And so and I'm sure the people inside the palace now who are a very good team will be balancing that. I mean, the photograph, the family photograph being a good example. I'm a great believer we look at this on when it hits the fan, you either have a cock-up or a conspiracy. And I think everything we're seeing around this so far has been a cock-up rather than a conspiracy. And that photograph, people really moved on for it. But it's just a reminder, as you say, the obsessive interest there is in the minutiae of what's happening in the royal family. Managing that and anticipating it, I think, is what defines good advice in the palace. That's the key thing. If you were in charge not a flunky, a, a senior flunky, yeah. figure at the palace right now, Simon Lewis. What would you be advising Kate and William to do? I think I'd be advising to do exactly what they're doing. Prince William is going back to his engagements and he's always has a fantastic impact. I saw the, the images from Sheffield. Uh, the Princess of Wales is obviously getting fitter. The summer's always an active time for the royal family. I have no idea but I wouldn't be surprised if some of the summer events that the royal family like to go to would be a great opportunity uh, to see more of Kate. What I would not be advising to do is to rush anything else out. I do think in royal life, 
you know, rushing at things in the way that politicians rush at things, by and large, never works. People have a very different view of the royal family and what they expect of it. And that poll yesterday made it very clear that trust in the royal family is still at a very high level. And okay. it doesn't surprise me. Really good to talk to you. Simon Lewis, thank you very much indeed, former press secretary to the late Queen and, of course, also advisor at Number 10 as well. Thank you for joining us here on Talk TV. Bred uh, Benedict Spence still, still with us. Um, this is the thing, it, mm. it's different. You know, royals are different from celebrities. Yes. And they are different from politicians. Yes. Do you, if, you were, if you were advising William and Kate right now, what would you tell oh, I'm them? I'm sure you'd disagree with my opinion, which is that if you want to have a royal family that's actually going to last and endure, it needs to regain the element of mystique. Actually, it No, I wouldn't disagree with you on that. I, I think, think too much, too I, much I, out yes, there. Yes, I think that they've made themselves too much like celebrities. And if you're going to have a sort of an active role in society, well, maybe you should make yourself more political, which obviously would be very controversial. So they're not going to do that so you therefore have to sort of rarefy yourself even more and I think if you look at institutions that have survived over a very long time you think about the Vatican you think about uh, the Chinese Emperor that sort of thing <laughs> no I'm, I'm being <laughs> very now, I'm being yeah. very serious here actually it was all about cultivating as much mystique and separation now that's no, not no, but, no, no, but you yourself. can do that in medieval times no, you no. can even do that well, in the 1950s you say that or maybe the 1970s I don't think you can do correct. that with social media and I don't think you can do that with the 24-hour news no cycle. I disagree we actually need to, we need to see another picture the Chinese, communist, bomb. the Chinese Communist Party employs the exact same techniques that the Imperial Court did entirely to give itself that air of prestige. And we like to think yeah. about... They also, they so, also employ many, many, many hundreds of thousands of, of, of armed police as well and put people in business. I think, no, no, I think that this is a very important is, part is this, of... Is there an issue with the celebrification of the yeah. royal family and the expectation that they will be out and about and see at everything and co many, even things like commenting on the situation in Gaza and things mm. like that, that, that actually, if you are sort of... You're 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 you're, con you're constantly out there. That actually, then when you when you're not there. Mm that is a big sort of black hole and a vacuum that needs to be filled. Well, that's exactly my point, is that actually what you need to do is take the step back and put very sort of serious limits on what it is that you will and won't get involved in. I think what they do in terms of their uh, public engagements are very important, but yeah. you're right, there is now a vacuum because they're seen to be everywhere. That's the opposite of what okay. they should be doing. Very interesting. Love to hear your thoughts on this as well if you want to get in touch. But today I'm asking specifically about the a new smoking ban. The government is introducing a new law today in the Commons to ban anyone aged 14 or younger this year from ever being able to legally buy cigarettes. I want to know, do you agree or do you disagree with the ban? Tell us why as well. Give us a call 0344 499 1000. Text on 87222 or get in touch on X at Talk TV. Chuck has got in touch to say it's a stupid, expensive addiction that offers no benefits. Ban it. Robin says, we should do all we can to stop young people and even adults from smoking. I would also include vaping in this new regulation. And Chris says, I don't like the government telling people what they can and can't do with their own bodies. Uh, some of you have also been getting in touch on the phones. Please keep those calls coming in. Let's go to Linda, who is in London. Hello, Linda. Good morning, Julia. Good morning. What do you want to say? What do you think of this uh, new bill? I think that it's just a half measure. Either ban it or don't ban it. Because we're going to have a really ridiculous situation where somebody that's, say, 27 can buy a packet of cigarettes, but somebody that's 26 yeah. can't. And let's be honest, it's going to be the same as it is now. The 27-year-old is just going to buy the packet for the 26-year-old. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if people are that determined. And also, you know, how if you're working in a, a shop or something like that, you've got to constantly remember what the date is, what the year yeah. is. Can this person buy a cigarette? Can this person not? And asking and someone think... for ID when they're 58, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. An 18-year-old asking a 50-year-old for ID, you know. Um, it's an awkward situation for everybody. OK, but your solution is it's a half measure, so, so don't bring it in or... Or ban, ban it, ban... one or the other. One or the other. But would, which would you prefer? Um, I am a smoker. I've smoked since I was actually 14. Yeah. Um, and for me personally, banning it might actually get me to quit because that, you know, my husband's amazing. My husband's actually just quit after Brilliant. smoking for 40 years. Wow. Um, seven, you know, he's now seven and a half weeks um, smoke free. He's amazing. And you're not doing um, it I'm together, doesn't he? When you, when you go out for a, for a CE, doesn't he go, what are you doing? Not at the moment. I think we'll get there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah because, that, because ex smokers happen. tend to be the most sort of, you know, obsessed with people not smoking. No, I've never smoked. No, it doesn't interest me at all. I don't understand why. I think it's a crazy way to spend your money oh, on dying not. earlier. I genuinely think it's insane. But do you not think there's an element where, like, if, if you're not smoking indoors in someone's workplace, in, in the cinema or on a... If you're not bothering other people, what 
sodding business out of anyone else's? Well, I also think this government, you know, they keep going on about how, you know, smoking costs the NHS, and it, and it does, but, you know, the taxes that come in... But More also, than paid I, Yeah, and I don't understand... If they're saying, oh, you're going to live, you're not going to live as long if you smoke, well, then yep. I'm not going to cost the government as much money, am I? Because I'm not yep. going to need oh, long-term No, you've, you've nailed it. No, genuinely, the biggest contribution smokers make to the, the finances of the country aren't the taxes they pay, which is most of the cost for packet of cigarettes. It's dying early and not claiming their pensions for as long. That is literally <laughs> the biggest contribution they make, which, come on, if that is an incentive, I don't know. Linda, so appreciate your call. Thank you very much for getting in touch. Coming up after the break, uh, we are going to be talking to a healthcare expert who supports the ban. This is Talk TV. I'm Julia Hartley-Brewer. Stay tuned. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, we're absolutely. Supposed to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley-Brewer. You are with Talk TV. Just some breaking news before we get to our, our next uh, conversation. London Underground drivers will strike on April the 8th and May the 4th in their long-running dispute over terms and conditions. That's been confirmed from their union, ASLEF. Uh, I mean, drivers, by the way, on about around 60 grand a year for pressing stop, go, open doors, close doors. Well done, lads. If you can manage to get more money for doing that, all credit to you. But... Um, Seriously, uh, how the capital city puts up with this, I do not know. Well done, Sadiq Khan, as well. But there we are. Uh, right, let's move on and talk about the smoking ban. We're asking you to get in touch about this. The bill has uh, just uh, been published in the House of Commons today, making it illegal for anyone born after January 2009, so someone who's 14 this year, 
to ever be legally allowed to buy cigarettes in this country. Well, joining me right now is healthcare expert uh, Soren Govid. Uh, good morning to you, Soren. Uh, and also uh, still with us is Benedict Spence as well. Now, um, you are a practicing pharmacist. You're also uh, a health lawyer. Um, do you think this uh, this ban, which effectively will mean in you know in in a few years' time that that someone who is 18 won't be able to buy cigarettes legally, but someone who is sort of 18 in a day is able to buy cigarettes legally. Is that a good idea? Well, it's a positive step forward given the lack of public funding when it comes to healthcare initiatives that, you know, there's been year on year decrease when it comes to public health. So the four in five smokers start bit below the age of 20 and then carry on for life. Yeah, I've not met anyone who didn't start around 14 or 15. So we need to be tackling those who are starting early. And this means that, that we want to stop people at the very roots before they even contemplate Well, hold on a minute. It. So people are starting smoking. While it's still illegal to buy cigarettes, they're still getting hold of cigarettes. So, I mean, and you say like, it was about funding. I mean, I, I do find it very frustrating. I see people, I've sat in the chemist sometimes and see someone getting their, their, their free prescription for their, uh, their, their nicotine patches or their nicotine gum. Um, and you think, well, if you can afford cigarettes, you can afford nicotine patches and nicotine gum. You don't need to have government funding for this. It's all available. There are numerous websites to help you, numerous groups that can help you. It's cheaper to give up smoking than it is to, to, to smoke. Why on earth does the government need to fund anything? Well, it's a positive step forward. And we know in New Zealand that they are, have already started on this journey, but we're not going to see the no, results no, no. They until brought the, No, they brought the ban. They were bringing the ban in and yeah. then they decided to backtrack on it. The new government came in and banned it. Well, they, banned the ban. They banned the ban. They were thinking about this, obviously, in New Zealand. But I think... Overall, what are the government doing when it comes to public health and smoking? And we've heard about vaping this morning. Now, vapor, vaping should only be introduced instead of smoking. Yeah. But we know that you can go along your high street and pick up a, a, a vape from pretty much anywhere. Yeah. I mean, they're ev they are literally everywhere. I mean, I, you walk down the street and you get covered in a cloud of smoke, don't you? You can't escape mm. them. And whilst you might say it's personal responsibility, my choice, it's certainly not my choice to f uh, inhale all that smoke. OK, look, we stop people smoking and, and largely you can't vape indoors uh, either. And I'm all in... I mean, that smoking ban that came in in 2007, I I'm, I'm, can't be more in favour of. And I think it helped a lot of smokers as well. But the single... The two biggest decreases is in people smoking in this country have basically come about as a smoking ban so it made it easier for people they're not allowed to smoke in the pub or in the workplace just became easier to give up but then of course it was the advent of vaping i know so many people who've moved on to vaping not desirable but better so much we know it's not completely you know health cost free but it is so much better but you can deal with the issue of, you know, I mean, this, this, this law is going to bring in, you know, a, a ban on disposable vapes because it's more likely to be kids using them and the brightly coloured and the, the flavour that the teenage girls like. But you can tackle this by simply enforcing the law as it exists currently, which is that you ain't allowed to buy this stuff if you're under 18. Why don't we just enforce the laws we already have? Well, at the moment, when you go along the high street and those vape shops, they have no duty of care to tell anyone of, about what exactly is in those products. The fact that you can get cherry-flavoured and cola-flavoured, we shouldn't be seeing them marketed to young people. So I think anything that tackles that's a positive step forward. With cigarettes, for example, about one in, for one in four cancer deaths mm. are because of smoking, it's a preventable illness. But, but, OK, there's a difference in the like, 1950s when people are starting smoking, even probably up to the 70s, and people were told, I mean, you, the advert, are extraordinary. It's like, you know, it's healthy to smoke. You know, we've known for decades now that smoking is bad for you. Smoking will lead to numerous, uh, you know, heart disease, cancer, um, and you're going to die. I mean, you're basically going to die about 10 years earlier, as on, on average. If you don't die of cigarette smoke, something from cigarette is because you've died of something else first. You, uh, it's going to kill you. We know that. Now, there's an argument then to say, well, these are cancer sticks. They should be banned. They, if 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 manufacturer bought this product onto the market today, not a chance in hell they'd be able to legally sell it. But they exist. They're happening. Smoking is now down from vast majority of adults doing it to a tiny percentage uh, are doing it. Vaping has helped with that. Do we need any more than that? Can't we just accept that sometimes people will make bad decisions about their health, and they're allowed to do that? 
So I absolutely agree. We, we have free choice. We um, also don't want to, people to uh, not feel like they can't go about their day-to-day -day lives, but ultimately as well, some of these, uh, these decisions do impact other people. If you smoke, um, you can, passive smoking, such a big issue. Not, but you don't, there aren't, people don't smoke indoors anymore. Well, I've definitely cases. been to, I've definitely experienced going to a, a club during a, the smoking ban where someone did light up and whilst venues and can... And still alive. The, and still alive. Still alive. To tell the tale. tale. Yeah, but you're talking about odd occasions. It's, it's so rare that happens. No, but this thing, you say, you know, people should be allowed to go about the daily business, but you're basically saying you could be an adult in this country in a few years' time and you will not be allowed to buy a legal product. That's insane. Well, it's definitely a, a positive step forward if we're making people more aware about their health. No, no, they're already aware. They already know. They already know. Uh, well, I this is This is, come on, this is just na nanny state stuff telling people what they can and can't do, and you know what's next. A complete ban and... Benedict said earlier, they're going to come for the alcohol as well next. Well, alcohol definitely wouldn't be um, wouldn't be approved now, would it, if, if, if it was... Benedict, they're going to come for alcohol I, I next, aren't they? I've tasted it, it's great. I think it'll be approved. I think, uh, look, what this boils down to, as you say, that this is eventually going to be a total ban, because that'll, you know, by, by necessity. What that then does is it pushes the trade into the arms of criminal organisations. This country is already awash with illegal drugs, so much yep. so that the police simply don't bother to respond yep. and, to the majority of And smuggled of it. cigarettes. And, and cigarettes, because they don't cause such a social issue as drugs do, what are the odds that they're actually going to respond to that? It just puts money in the hands of criminal organisations. Come on, what did you say to that? Well, I think the police have got enough to do. I would agree with that. I mean, I've experienced uh, abuse in the pharmacy and you can't get someone to attend yep. because they're, they're so busy. Um, there's but, always going to be whatever drug or alcohol, even even drugs, medical drugs, that people do try and obtain so, them illegally. Yeah, it's not going to work. I'm just, I, and again, again, they're going to come for my booze next. Uh, coming up in the next hour, big thanks, by the way, to Soren Govian. Thank you for that. Coming up in the next hour, one in five police officers are planning to quit within the next two years. We'll talk about Donald Trump and NATO as well. This is Talk TV. I'm Julia Hartley-Brewer. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put the statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, yeah. minutes, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong.
Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good morning and welcome to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer and you're with Talk TV. We're on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. And I'm with you live from 10 until 1. Coming up in this hour, the Data Watchdog is investigating a major security breach of the Princess of Wales after reports that staff at her private hospital tried to gain unauthorised access to her medical records. This comes as new polling shows that over half of the British public have seen the conspiracy theories about her health. What the other half been doing? And one in five police officers in England and Wales say they are planning to quit the force within the next two years, according to a new survey by the Police Federation. And former President Donald Trump says he is committed to keeping the United States in NATO, but only as long as other European countries treat America fairly. First, though, let's get the latest news headlines with Bhavani Vade. Good morning. UK inflation has fallen to its lowest level for two and a half years. Figures from the Office for National Statistics show that the price of goods and services fell to 3.4% in February, down from 4% in January and the lowest since September 2021. Meanwhile, tomorrow, the Bank of England is widely expected to hold interest rates at 5.2%. The Chancellor says it's a big improvement during Rishi's time in power. And what this shows is that the plan to bring inflation down, it was over 11% when Rishi Sunak became Prime Minister, uh, now just 3.4%. That plan is working, but we do need to stick to it and see it right the way through. Bosses at a hospital where the Princess of Wales was treated have launched an investigation following claims staff tried to access her private medical records. The security breach happened at the London Clinic in January while she was a patient undergoing surgery there. The hospital is known for treating politicians and celebrities. The data watchdog is assessing the report. Our royal editor Sarah Hewson told us the claims today are a huge concern. But this is extremely serious if these allegations are true, uh, because what is claimed is that a member of staff or several members of staff tried to access the Princess of Wales's private medical information during her 13-day stay at the London Clinic following abdominal surgery. Now, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you're a member of the royal family or if you are you know, the most famous person in the world, you are still entitled to medical privacy. Nearly a quarter of police officers are planning to resign in the next two years. The Police Federation of England and Wales said 85% of those polled said they are not fairly paid given the dangers they face in the job, with 15% saying they'd suffered one or more injuries in the past year. More than 9,000 officers have left the service in the year to March 2023. Former Met detective Peter Bleaksley says it's a perfect storm that will affect the service significantly. As much as they're trying to shovel brand new officers in through the front door, officers are leaving through the back door, not only because of pay, but because they're poorly trained, so they're not, they're not ready to fight crime when they get onto the front line. There's no experience to show them how to do it. The supervision and management is awful a lot of the time. And, of course, morale is absolutely on the floor. The National Audit Office has revealed it is in fact cheaper to house asylum seekers in hotels than in any of the government's planned alternatives. The Home Office wants to put them in barges and former RAF bases, but apparently it will cost the taxpayer £46 million more. Greg stores across the UK are closed due to an IT issue which is affecting card payments. In a statement, the bakery chain added, we are working to resolve this as soon as possible. It follows card payment outages at Sainsbury's and Tesco on Saturday and McDonald's last Friday. 
and broadcaster Tony Blackburn will be made an OBE in a ceremony at Windsor Castle today. The 81-year-old presenter has appeared on BBC and commercial radio stations for nearly six decades and became the first DJ on BBC Radio 1 when it launched in 1967. He will be honoured for his services to broadcasting and to charity. That's the latest. Now time for a look at today's weather with Nazan and Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello, mild for many this afternoon. Sunshine for some, mainly across Scotland and Northern Ireland, but for others it's generally looking quite cloudy and rainy, mainly across Northern England into the Midlands, Eastern England, Wales and the West Country into this afternoon. Down towards the South East, there should be some good amounts of sunshine and it will be mildest there with temperatures locally up to 17 degrees Celsius, but also feeling pleasantly mild across parts of the North with the light winds and the sunshine for Scotland and Northern Ireland, where we'll probably see highs of around 12. Now, overnight, that front of rain will continue its journey further south and eastwards, most of it turning light and patchy in nature. It will be a mild, cloudy night across parts of central, southern and eastern England with mist and murk forming. Clear spells further north and west before more wind and rain spreads to the far northwest of Scotland and Northern Ireland with severe gales likely then. It will be a cool night across parts of the north. And then over tomorrow we will continue to see that rain spread its way further eastwards across Scotland with some heavy downpours across the high ground of the west. Northern Ireland and the Republic becoming wet and northern England later too, but the rest of England and Wales will be mostly fine and bright and feeling mild in the south. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good morning and welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer and you are with Talk TV. Still with me in the studio, going through all of the biggest stories of the day, is Conservative commentator Benedict Spence. Uh, good uh, morning to you once again. Um, let's talk about this uh, Kate data breach. Don't worry, guys, we'll move on quickly. I know a lot of people say, oh, no, no, no. But it is extraordinary that someone, or anyone, I don't care whether you are Mrs Bloggs from number 47 down the road mm. or you're the future Queen of England, everyone should have a right when they go into hospital to make sure that their data is secure and no one is looking up, oh, wonder what she was really in for, how serious is it, what, you know. And you have a right to privacy. Now, we've had a privacy breach before, and this is the hospital, this mm. private hospital that she, she's she been at. We've had one before uh, involving her when she was in hospital um, uh, previously. And, and, of course, that involved a woman who, who spoke thinking she was talking. She was one of some Australian pranksters on the radio. Mm. And she thought she was talking to, rather foolishly, frankly, to uh, the Queen and Prince Philip. And she later committed suicide because she was so mortified by what she did. Yeah. You know, these, these, these have serious repercussions, these things. They do have serious repercussions. And you're right, actually, she is She's a human being like anybody else, and actually, it is especially if some of the rumours about what is wrong with her aren't true, I think it's particularly egregious, therefore, for people to try to uncover it and yeah. make it public. It's none of your business. It's not really. And you can imagine if you had some sort of serious medical ailment that kept you in bed for two weeks, that's probably... probably in a hospital for Yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. That's a very serious thing. So you don't really need, on top of the, 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 the pain you imagine mm -hmm. you're probably in, to also have people, you know, to have to second-guess whether or not your nurse or your... Uh, and and it's not the same. We're not like, you know, we're not in wartime no. where we've got a problem. Prime Minister who's incapacitated. I mean, yeah. things like we had in America, the Defence Secretary, he was in hospital on a number of occasions and that wasn't divulged to, to the public. Also, apparently not even to the President, maybe mm. he wasn't aware, I don't know. Um, um, but, no, that, that, that matters. That yeah. does matter. If you have a role like that, I'm sorry, but but the Princess of Wales' role is is not that sort of role. She's not running the no, country. No, it, it's it's sort of we haven't really moved on. I think from sort of the Middle Ages when the peasants would all be gossiping about what the lords and ladies are getting <laughs> to and having a good old laugh at their expenses. We are it's, the peasants. It's reassuring to know that we are still fundamentally those people. Yeah. And what goes on with them upstairs is still a source of so much preoccupation to us, yeah. even with all the rest of the stimulus that we have in the world. Absolutely. I do want to mention, by the way, the, the news that came out at seven o'clock this morning: um, inflation mm. falling from. I mean, this is actually quite a big fall from 4% in January to the latest figures from the Office for National Statistics in February to 3.4%. We are now on track mm. um, to hit that sort of 2% target. I mean, goodness me, the Bank of England hasn't hit that target for a long time. And the hope then, of course, not just to price this again. They're not going to go down. They're going to carry on going up, but not by the same rate. We've seen food certainly going up by mm. something like 30% in some cases. Um, but, but food and energy and everything else 
continue to go up, but at a much lower rate, the sort of rates we're used to, around the 2% mark. Yeah. This could mean, finally, the Bank of England actually cutting interest rates instead of stopping putting them up. Um, any hope for that? And, and how big an issue do you think that will be at the next election? Is a cost of living issue? Will that, will, that, will that just not be an issue at the next election? It's one of those things that you, makes you wonder whether or not they might bring the election forward, because that is good news, you know, ultimately, that they've been able to... Well, they've been able to bring these things down. But the, what we've learned over the last couple of years is that interest rates in the UK are, are very almost uniquely exposed to global events. And I think what we need to remember is... Um, we, we have yet to see, I think, the knock-on of inflation of what's been going on uh, in Yemen and the effects that that's had on global shipping. We've yet to feel the full knock-on effects of the uh, United States uh, ban on the export of uh, liquefied natural gas. If there is a Trump presidency, if it looks like Donald that's Trump... That's only, only if they need it. If, if it looks like Donald Trump will become president of the United States, what I would expect to see is two things. One is Israel intensifying its operations in Gaza, which will lead to even more repercussions in the Gulf of Aden with the Houthis, which will also have an effect on trade. The other thing is I suspect Ukraine will start targeting Russian oil infrastructure in Russia. That will also have a knock-on effect mm. on global fuel prices. So actually, it is something that we could see come back in the very short term. That's, that's issue. And again, it's something, even though this was one of the pledges from the Prime Minister, that he was going to attack, you know, get inflation down, mm. uh, you know, but you know, he, he, it wasn't it wasn't his fault. It was that the no. inflation went up, and it was not actually his his ability to bring it down. That's exactly. the reality. I'll tell you something that's definitely going to be an issue at the next election, no doubt at all. And that is Rwanda, channel migrants, illegal right. migration, legal migration as well. And two big stories. Well, three big stories, I suppose, today in the news on that. One is the National Audit Office report, it's like a finance watchdog for the government uh, for government spending, basically finding out that the plans to house asylum seekers not in hotels, but actually on barges and former RAF bases is actually going to cost the Home Office, i.e. you and me, £1.2 billion. And that is £46 million more than the cost of keeping people in hotels. Mm. That's insane. Well, you've got to remember a lot of these facilities that are being used, they were not purpose-built for, yeah. uh, for this. Therefore, it takes a lot of money, first of all, to actually get them up to a standard where anybody could live in them, let alone you know, RAF personnel, you know, because they've not been doing that for a long time. To bring barges across the sea takes a very long time. You then need to use that expression, future-proof them, so that if something goes wrong, the government can say, well, we crossed absolutely everything off yeah. the list in case people then start to sue them because somebody died. Like, not, like not having an outbreak of Legionnaires. Exactly. Disease. So they have yes. to be incredibly fastidious, and that comes at our expense, obviously. Whereas yeah. the hotel has done that expense off its own back, so you can see why it's a lot cheaper then to end up lumping them in that, you know, yeah. in commercial well, properties. Yeah, yeah, and of course, a lot of these are upfront costs, but still, it comes at a time when most people say, "Look, just these people still shouldn't be here. They should be on a plane to Rwanda." Now we've got the Rwanda bill; mm. it's back in the Lords today. Yeah. Uh, this after the Lords uh, voted in ten amendments, which were basically trying to basically stop any planes ever taking off. Uh, the House of Commons the MPs voted down those uh, those 10 amendments. It now goes back to the Lords. They're apparently going to bring about half of them back in. If we have that ping pong, ping pong, we're looking at a delay past Easter uh, for the bill to actually get royal assent. It, look, the Commons will win eventually. Mm. The Lords have to give up it's, you know, and, uh, because the Commons are the elected uh, uh, representatives of the country. And just like the judges, peers are not elected. Um, but we're looking at yet another delay to any planes ever taking off to mm. Rwanda. Um, do you think they're ever going to happen? What do you think the Lords should do now? Not in, not in this Parliament, I don't think they're going to really? happen. No, I, don't, I think that this is something, actually, that could play into Rishi Sunak's hand if he's able to then say, if, people get, if there's a massive increase in the summer of people coming across the end, Which Sunak will be. is able to say, look, I want this to happen, but I can't because they're blocking it and the Labour Party will let this happen. It could play into his hand. So there is that argument to say, in some ways, it might be in his interest to say, actually, guys, you've got to give me a bigger mandate here because otherwise it's only going to get worse. Um, so I don't think it is going to happen. Except, I, I mean, I I think people could say, you can definitely say if you're concerned about this issue, voting Labour is going to make this issue yeah. an awful lot worse. However, sure. um, I'm, I'm very much <laughs> of the view that the British public are going, whatever you say you're going to do about yeah. it, saying what you're going to do and saying, oh, someone's stopping me when you've been in power this long. Okay, Rishi Sunak hasn't been in power this long, mm. but it's certainly been in power long enough to have passed this bill where there's a will. And anyway, still not going to make a blind bit of difference sure. to anything. Tell you what is going to make a blind bit of difference to anything is if, well, Depending on how they're housed when they arrive here at asylum seekers, particularly channel migrants, it's also whether they're allowed to work or not. And the good old Archbishop of Canterbury has got another great idea. Of course he has. Justin Welby has joined with other faith leaders uh, for a report by the Independent Commission on the Integration of Refugees. Any independent report, anything to do with refugees now, is always mm. a load of do-gooders basically you know, wringing their hands and pouring their hearts out and telling everyone what wonderful, lovely people they are while they don't have to deal with the fallout of this issue. Mm. They are saying that... Um, broken. The asylum system is broken, so that's, yeah, tell us something Good we stuff. don't know. Yeah, exactly. They want free English language education for people as soon as they arrive in this country. 
but 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 again, like what why why am I paying for that? Um, but also, migrants should be eligible to work in the UK after six months of waiting for an asylum decision. So that would be everyone basically mm. eventually, because you ain't getting anything decided in six months. But crucially, when there is a, a, a there are jobs on the shortage occupation list, they should be eligible for work on day one mm. and and be eligible. I didn't even spot this earlier for a government backed finance scheme to help refugees set up businesses. So not only come here, make your life here, whether you're here legally or not, mm. we, you can have a job. We'll give you some money, set up a business. We'll put you in a hotel or, or, in a, or any other accommodation, you know, for free. I mean, they're taking, I mean, these yeah. people are taking the mick out of the British people. British people don't get any of this stuff. Of course, and if they start setting up businesses and they employ other migrants as part of that, then it's all going to help their case when it comes to say, well, look, I'm a productive yep. member of society, and even though actually I said I was a refugee, but I'm not, actually it would be what, in your what interest. What if their business is, is people trafficking? Why do you set up a business making dinghies, bringing in, importing dinghies? Would be a smart move, frankly. I mean, <laughs> you know, given the demand it's, for it. But honestly... It's painful, I, isn't it? It is, and it, it, again, it boils everything down to, ah, oh, well, you have to let people in because they're a net benefit to the economy, which, they're A, not. they're not. And also, why is is it that we're treating these people as as subsistence labor why is this a good thing why is it that you're yeah. enticing people to come and say you can live a slightly better life than you lived over there by earning less than any british person is prepared to accept because yeah. spoiler alert yeah. it is subsistence labor and it's unacceptable yeah exactly and also i mean th th this 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 bizarre idea that that you know that that this, as you say, this is a benefit to people and that these people are all desperate. Mm. They're coming from France. Yeah. I'm desperate always to get to France, for goodness sake. It's an absolute... Makes not you very unusual as a Brit, Makes, I must say. It, 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 it but does. But you are it unusual. Does. France and <laughs> Spain, that's where we go on holidays, isn't it, guys? Um, let's also talk about this smoking ban. Um, the government has introduced a new law uh, to ban... The bill is coming into the Parliament, Parliament today uh, to ban anyone who's aged 14 or younger this year, so anyone born after 2009, from ever being able to legally buy cigarettes. I want to know from you, before we find out more what Benedict thinks on this, do you agree or do you disagree with this ban? Is it a nanny state? Uh, is this actually a, you know, a really sensible uh, health move? Uh, tell us why you think what you do as well. Give us a call on 0344 499 text on 8722, or get in touch on X at Talk TV. Calls are charged at the national rate. Text costs one standard network rate message. Um, Benedict, um, we've had a guest in on this, a uh, uh, pharmacist. And, and look, smoking's bad for you. Yeah. You are likely to die early if you, if you smoke. It is bad for your health in terms of you know, cancer, heart disease, everything else. Mm. It's incredibly expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, it's pretty anti-sociable. You smell. And by the way, if you don't think you do, maybe you do. Um, why would anyone do it? Apart from that, it's addictive. Mm. But it exists. We've got it in the same way that we have alcohol and yeah. chocolate. My two favourite vices. Um, do you think this ban, A, will work and B, is desirable? I don't think it'll work. Uh, I've already said, uh, it'll, draw, it'll just drive the trade into the hands of criminal organisations who will profit and they're very effective at swamping this country with illegal drugs as it is. So what are the odds that they wouldn't be able to get lots of cigarettes yeah. which are far less dangerous? Look, it didn't work when the United States banned uh, the sale and consumption of alcohol. If anything, in some places, alcohol consumption went up, profits went up from those who were going to make them. When the US put sanctions on Cuba and said you can't import Cuban cigars, did that stop people who wanted cigars getting them? No, their profits went up as well. That's always what happens, is you just drive the trade underground. And I do think it's slightly uh, quiz uh, curious that at the exact moment that we're having this drive to get rid of cigarettes, there is a, also a very loud lobby in this country saying that we should legalise marijuana. And you kind of yeah. think they're thinking, huh? well, uh, uh, w what is the direction that we're going on here? I know which of the two I'd far rather have yeah, legalised, and that's but, cigarettes. But at the same time, also, this ban on disposable vapes that we've yeah. heard so much about, and again, the hysteria about, oh, all children and the littering. Look, they're all children already banned from, <laughs> from buying disposable vapes. It, all you need to do in a force law, it's really, really simple. You just have some very high profile mm. penalties. You remove the licenses and, you know, tens of thousands of pound fines mm. for the shops that are selling these disposable vapes. I'm sorry, it's really simple. You, all you have to do is, we never need new laws these days. Mm. We need to enforce the laws we already have. But also, I mean, the flavours, I've got an issue with this and everything, but there needs to be more education about it. But I think a lot of the kids who are trying vapes, a lot of yeah. the kids who are doing that stuff, they're the kids who used to smoke, yeah. who used to sniff glue. Yep. Well, you know what? <laughs> I'd rather they were vaping. I was going to say, it's always that attitude from Puritans. Won't somebody please think of the ch children, not assuming that it might be the children that are the devious little ones that are getting their hands on these things, whatever you do, and just putting more barriers, just 
just makes them more determined to get a hold of this stuff. I was a child. I remember that no, when I started. No, no, I have to say, most of us thought you were sort of in one of in those sort of Matrix style eggs. Yes, that's, I mean, okay, fine. <laughs> Found it out. I lied. All right, okay, fine. No, like, but this is the thing. Everybody, uh, when I was at school, people drank underage, they smoked underage, yes. they did all sorts of things that they weren't supposed to because they're children, because they're pushing boundaries. Just because you say, oh, well, we're going to enforce this law, does not mean the children are going to go, oh, well, well in that the, case, the party's I, over. I know, this is, this is the thing. And again, I'm anti smoking, but again, mm. I, I, I'm, I keep saying, I've kind of been on this journey about being quiet and nanny state until I realized that the nanny state people, they want to ban everything. They don't want us to have, they don't want you to be able to, you know, eat cereal or, or, or eat yeah. white bread. <laughs> uh, they don't want you to have wine, alcohol. They want, they want to ban. They want to ban cake. They want to ban chocolate. They want yep. to ban sweets. They want to ban sugar. They want to ban everything. Then the moment this comes in and people have the nonsense mm -hmm. of an 18-year-old uh, being not being able to buy cigarettes, but an 18-year-old plus a day being able to buy cigarettes, they'll get, everyone go. This is madness, and their solution will be Benedict. A total ban is total what they'll ban. Go. That's and what they're going to come next. If they feel they can get away with it, will be an alcohol uh, ban. Yeah, it will. That's what they it want. will be. That is what they're going to want next. And yeah, that's the thing. So. I'm gonna to have to defend, I'm gonna to have to be forced to defend smoking to keep to keep my fizz, <laughs> to keep my fizz in my bourbonville. That's what I'm gonna to have to do. Um, let's also talk about Donald Trump. We're gonna talk about it a little bit later also with um, the Chairman of Republicans Overseas UK, Greg Swenson. But uh, Donald Trump uh, did an interview with Nigel Farage on uh, GB News. Congratulations for that interview, uh, Nigel, at Mar-a-Lago. Um, uh, and uh, crucially, he was talking about the state of NATO. Let's have a watch and a listen of what Donald Trump had to say. The United States should pay its fair share, not everybody else's fair share. No, fair enough. I believe the United States was paying 90% of NATO, the cost of yep. NATO, could be 100%. Yep. It was the most unfair thing. And don't forget, it's more important to them than it is to us. We have an ocean in between some problems, okay? We have a nice, big, yep. beautiful ocean. And it's more important for them. They were taking advantage, and they did. They took advantage of us okay. on trade, and they took advantage on So if the they military. play fair, if they start to play fair, America's there. Yes, 100%. I'll tell you what, I find it really difficult when I have to agree with Donald Trump, but I thought he was right when he said that all yeah. those years ago when he was president, that, you know, it's simply unfair for the American taxpayers mm. to have to pay for the defence of Europe when there are we're plenty of us. We cannot continue to rely on the US to fund everything. Now, one thing is encouraging is he is saying, look, if a NATO member is attacked in Europe, the US would, would turn up. And thank goodness for that, because there have been some question marks about how reliable Donald Trump is. I think what you would see happen very quickly is a lot of funding for Ukraine dry up. That's not the same as the rest of Europe, yep. obviously, because I, ultimately I know that However, lots of Americans... However, if funding for Ukraine dries up, there's more likely to be an attack on a NATO member Well, this Russia. is the thing, actually, and this is why I don't think you'd then see the end of US involvement in Europe, is that ultimately, I know a lot of Democrats like to say that Donald Trump is in the pay of Vladimir Putin, but ultimately Donald Trump is out for himself, and I don't think he's interested in losing, if you will, an appendage measuring contest with Vladimir Putin. He would not want to see his turf, and the United States does consider Europe its turf, being trampled any further by Putin. I'm sure he'd be happy to say, look, Ukraine, nothing to do with us, you keep that, which would be very bad, obviously. But would he tolerate, you know, the, the Russia, you know, menacing Poland or Germany or the Baltics? Actually, I don't think he'd put up with that. No, indeed, indeed. I just want to please have one more topic in. Well, it's, well, it's three topics that sort of into one, but it's all woke nonsense. And we're mm. constantly told, oh, well, it's the right wing who are bringing these culture wars. Okay. No, we're not. This, this is literally happening under our watch. This is just three stories uh, today. Um, um, the business secretary, Kemi Badenoch, uh, has said that Britain's diversity drive has been counterproductive and hasn't actually reduced prejudice, despite millions being spent on inclusivity mm. initiatives and basically saying, you know, you, you know, you can't just focus on, you know, black women like herself. What about, you know, white working class men and the like? Uh, and pointing out, you know, having a, a rainbow lanyard and uh, compulsory pronouns isn't how you foster inclusion. And in fact, actually, mm. you kind of actually make the situation worse because when all you're talking about is someone's colour of their skin or, or their gender or, or their sexuality or anything else, then, then you're not about anything else. Now, mm. this, this, this happens on the same day it's emerged that a lawyer who's linked to the Department for the Environment is being sued with her department after she made gender-critical statements at work, i.e. basically said that, very very clear, a joint signatory to a letter about working with the civil service, mm. about how, you know, Trans women are not women, which they're not, because they're men. That's literally the point of being a trans woman. They're men. Um, and basically is, is going to, you know, uh, going to a tribunal over basically the statement of fact, because basically saying you are hounded out of your job in the civil service now mm. if you basically refuse to lie. Yeah. That, that is what it's about. We've got these new hate laws in Scotland. Um, JK Rowling, me and pretty much every other woman I know, quite willing to go to prison in return for not being forced to lie. Mm. But we're having this stuff thrust down our throats. The latest... 
Blackpool Council. They tweeted this morning, Residents were in for a surprise this morning after zebra crossings on Dixon Road saw a colourful transformation overnight. Sorry, this actually was tweeted yesterday. Uh, and these are, if you're, if you're listening rather than watching, a zebra crossing. They've actually kept the white bit, thank goodness, so you can have white black bit, but they put underneath the white paint, of, uh, they've got a, a not, not just even a rainbow, but of course the, 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 the all-inclusive mm. pride flag, which is, includes Black Lives Matter. And it's basically, in my view, uh, both a racist and a misogynistic flag in terms of trans rights, attacking women's rights. Um, this, by the way, from a council where um, council are cutting, they're looking for cuts of £16 million mm -hmm. on the budget. Council tax is going up 5% this year. Blackpool has, in the last couple of years, the lowest life expectancy for men in the country, mm. 10 years lower than the parts of the country with the highest life expectancy, mm. 10 years lower. But Blackpool Council has got money to spend mm. On painting rainbow flags on, on, on a zebra crossing. You know, I, I I can't wait for a Conservative government to come in and really shift the dial of yeah. the national discussion. You know, whenever that whenever they win, that'll be fantastic. You know, give them a decade, decade and a half. I'm sure they could do wonderful things. Honestly, the fact that we've actually got to have this, you know, a minister like Henry Baden not coming out and saying, look, guys, this is in nobody's interest, it's counterproductive. I think she also cited that it had cost the Exchequer something like half a billion, all of these policies across companies you know, in, in diversity drives. To, to see the state of the country, to say we don't have money for the armed forces, we don't have money for X, Y, Z, yeah. but we've got enough time and capacity yeah. to just waste on this sort Literally. of stuff. Literally, and by nonsense. the way, you think, oh, there's a bit of paint. Oh my God, do you have any idea how much like a road bump costs? Do you have any idea? That would have that cost would have been thousands, and safety and... thousands and thousands yeah. of pounds. And again, it makes it hard for people who've like partially sighted. It's, mm. it's, it's confusing for children when you're teaching children about where it is safe to close across the road. By the way, the leader of Blackpool Council, Councillor Lynn Williams, who, who should be frankly out on her ear, uh, she's a ward councillor for the local area. She says, the crossings were, I'm going to use a stupid voice because I'm guessing she speaks with a stupid voice, an injection of colour. I mean, for God's sake, a celebration of the area's diversity. Has anybody ever been to Blackpool? I mean, but, that's not but, the thing but that I'm stands sorry, out. Yeah, genuinely, I mean, genuinely, this stuff makes me so angry. Do not tell me that it's the right that is forcing these culture wars. We are just trying to get back to sanity. That's all we're trying to do. And amidst all of this, a lifelong Labour voter in J.K. Rowling is the one who yep. has the finances and the, the wherewithal to actually stand up and say, yep. enough of this nonsense. Yes. But also, all these people go, oh, well, I'm gay, or I'm black, or I'm trans, or I'm bi, or whatever. I mean, I don't even know what queer actually even means. But, well, I, I, I can't possibly live in Blackpool. It's awful because I'm, 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 I'm so, so discriminated against. But, oh, there's some rainbow <laughs> paint on a zebra crossing. Mm. All is right with the world. I mean, this mm. is such such a nonsense and it's such an insult to everyone's intelligence and a waste of public money. Calm down, moving on. Today we are asking uh, about the government introducing a new law to ban anyone aged 14 or younger this year from ever being able to legally buy cigarettes. I want to know, do you agree, do you disagree? Tell us why. Give us a call. 0344 499 1000, text on 8722. We'll get in touch on X at Talk TV. We want to get in touch about... If you want to get in touch and defend rainbow crossing, zebra crossings, I would love to take your call. You'll be first on air, I promise. If you can defend them, all credit to you for that effort. I'd love to hear from you. But let's get back to the smoking ban. Susan says, I hate smoking, but I really dislike the government trying to control our lives. That's exactly where I am. Tina says, if people want to smoke, they will find a way to get it, no matter what. And Barbara says, this is a prime example of nanny state. They are taking away our freedom of choice. You've also been getting in touch, as I say, on the phones. Keep those calls coming in. Let's go to Tom in rugby. Hello, Tom. Hi, Julia. Hello. How are you? Very well. I'm, I'm, well, I'm saying very well. I'm a bit rank, rankled up by, by that last story. But what do you want to say about the smoking ban? I am a retired radiologist. Mm -hmm. And over my career, I probably diagnosed thousands of lung cancers, smoking yep. related. I used to biopsy them by sticking needles into people's chests. They were usually incredibly anxious and worried. And we did it with you know, great stuff, made it very relaxing. And when it was all over, they said, oh, gosh, that wasn't nearly as bad as I thought it was going to be. Um, and I was so grateful. And I thought, you're grateful because I've just diagnosed the fact that you're going to die yeah. in a few weeks or months. My yeah. own sister was a nurse and she was a heavy smoker and she tragically died of lung cancer. 
first manifesting itself by spreading to her bones. Yeah. Now, you said earlier that I don't mind what people do as long as it doesn't affect other people. But actually, it did. It affected her children yeah. who had to watch their mum die slowly and painfully and her grandchildren because they've lost a... Would yeah. have been a fabulous... Oh, no, I, I think it's... No, I, I, don't, I don't want anyone to smoke. I don't think smoke... I, I, don't, I think it's extraordinary that, that smoking was, was, was ever legal in this country. It's just, it's there. Look, I think I, when I see parents smoking, I'm genuinely... The view, the first thing you have to do the moment you become pregnant, become, you're about to become a dad, is you know that your job is to stay alive. I, I think it's insane. I think it's clinically insane for people to use cancer sticks as a way of getting through their day. I'm massively anti-smoking. But does this ban, does what the government do, is that going to make a difference? Is that going to save any lives? And, and, and is it just the first of many more bans that are about what people are able to do with their own bodies? I think what they have to do is we have to change the culture. And even if it only changes in small increments, year by year, we've got to try and reduce this awful habit. But we have done. Teenagers... There's been a well, massive fall in smoking. Massive. Yeah, it, needs to, it needs to fall even further because I saw see a reg used to see very regular lung cancers coming through. When I see teenagers smoking, oh. I want to scream at them, stop it. Well, it's I always dangerous. tell them off. I don't, I'm, I'm a busy body. I don't scream at them, but I tell them how stupid it is. But... I mean, the, the NHS has just banned puberty blockers for children because they've realised that they're finally, after years of us telling them so, they realise that they're very damaging to their health. Yeah. Well, look, the same is true for cigarettes and teenagers. We've well, no, 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 somehow. but cigarettes... Teenagers aren't allowed to smoke. In my day, you could, you could uh, buy cigarettes when you were 16. Now it's 18. We've already made it illegal. Same with vaping. It's illegal. So why don't we just enforce the laws we've already got? Well, I just think we've got to change the culture. And, um, you know, I think that even these small little steps, it might not have much effect, but if it has a small incremental effect of actually discouraging youngsters from taking up this habit, yeah. then I'm all for it. OK. Well, and you, you know about what you speak. You've dealt with the reality of smoking Absolutely. kills. It's that simple. It kills yeah. people. Um, thank you so much for your call. I really, really appreciate that, Tom. He's a retired radiologist. If you're a smoker, ser I mean, seriously. But again, it, I do think it should be personal decision. Though. I think there's enough help out there to help people. Vapes being a key part of it. Uh, coming up after the break, we're going to talk about the police. One in five police officers in England and Wales says they're planning to quit the force within the next two years. That's according to a new survey by the Police Federation. Federation. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer, and you're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. 
The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 did fail her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Harley-Brewer. You are with Talk TV. Now, one in five police officers in England and Wales say they're planning to quit the force within the next two years. That's according to a new survey by the Police Federation. Joining me now to discuss this is former Met Police Detective Hamish Brown, MBE. Good morning to you, Hamish. Um, talk about this in the office this morning. You think, well, one in five, and it's 22%. That's uh, of the respondents. Um, that, that's, that sounds pretty high. But I'm wondering, actually, if that is just the norm in most jobs, that about a fifth of people are saying, oh, I'm going to leave in the next few years. Is, is this worse than it's ever been? Yes, well, good morning to you, Julia. Well, there, there are a few things here. Yes, there, there is a turnover in the police and things have changed quite dramatically in the job market and society as a whole. You know, when I first joined all those years ago, it was a in effect, job for life, that was your career, and you put your head down and did your 30 plus years, which is uh, what I did, that was the norm. But things have changed now. Uh, people are coming in looking for just a few years, it looks good on the CV, that sort of thing, so they can pick and choose. And the difficulty is, when you've got that sort of attitude, I just wonder what motivates some people. Some people are yeah. brilliant and they're there for a few years. That's absolutely great. But have they looked through the reality of the situation, the messy scenes you're going to come across, not very nice. There's the psychological thing telling a, a lady that her husband won't be coming home again. And yeah. um, that is very, very hard. So are the officers up to that sort of pressure? Yeah. The shift work... And in fact, there's a stigma with being a police officer. Sometimes you're, you're held in high regard. But in other instances, uh, people tend not to like the police. No, or I, was, I was thinking that. Like I mean, when police. you're looking at different careers, you know, it's a young, young person looking for a job now, you know, in terms of the status you used to have as a police officer um, uh, and, and the career prospects and, and the sort of lifestyle you've had, very, very different. And especially when a lot of your, you know, your, 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 maybe your peers from, from a lot, we know a lot going from university now or from school, they're able to do working from home a couple of days a week and you have to be on the beat uh, every day. And as you say, in very difficult circumstances, I've got very very good friends who are police officers and the stories they tell me, absolutely. I mean, you know, it's not what most of us ever have to put up with in our daily jobs. Um, but I know that morale among police officers, because I know people come up to me, street police officers, people get in touch all the time, is, is so low about what they're being asked to do, how they're basically now, you know, social services as well as, as the police force. And that's been something that some police chiefs have raised as well. But feeling that, again, when we talked about this earlier, all of this sort of you know, there's this woke stuff, and they, they feel like they're, they're not able to do the job they want to do, which is to keep the streets safe, go after the wrong uns and, and arrest them. And they're just sitting there doing paperwork. They're dealing with, you know, people who are mentally ill. Um, and they just feel it's not the job they signed up to anymore. Yeah, you make a very good point there, Julia. And uh, I think the difficulty is that sometimes, or perhaps the police officers feel they're responsible for the country's ills, the nation's problems, which they're most certainly not. And if they find themselves at a political demonstration, I'll go no further than that, um, that they tend to come under attack because you weren't fair to them, you weren't fair yeah. to this, that, the other. And they're between a rock and a hard place, and they're just trying to keep the peace. It's as simple as that. So they are under pressure. And uh, those coming into the police must understand you're going to face that, and you can be a little bit disillusioned. And I think this is part of the recruiting process. What do you expect from the police? And some people go in, think within a few weeks they'll be driving police cars around 100 miles an hour or yeah. something like that. Well, it doesn't work that way. Um, it can be very 
uh, boring, laborious work, and it can be long hours, and, and things can be very difficult. But you know that there's so much pleasure you can take, even from dealing with the most sticky, horrible problems, and you get a very, I, I don't know, professional pride yeah. from doing a good job. Oh, absolutely. And that's the what people should I look know, to. Even when they're dealing with difficult things and dealing with, you know, um, um, grooming gangs, um, you know, until rescuing people from burning buildings and things. It's, it must be an incredibly rewarding job. And yet, we know, you say, difficult to recruit. We had a massive recruitment issue where governments didn't recruit enough people. We lost a lot of very experienced officers who we've lost them for all of their expertise and, and experience for years, you know, for, forever now. Um, um, but, but it's difficult to recruit people now and to retain people now. The only thing that seems to keep a lot of officers in the job right now, even though they're sort of despondent about the direction of policing, is, well, you know, if you do your 30 years, you get your full pension, you can go on do something else with that sort of 20, 25 grand a year guaranteed pension, uh, you know, which, let's face it, most people don't get in their in their early 50s, uh, it, um, but, but the police officers do. Uh, and I think a lot of people would argue quite rightly after seeing the work they do. But what is the solution? How do we boost morale? How do we make sure that police officers, people want to be police officers and the people who are already there want to stay? Well, uh, there, there are two issues. I've mentioned the recruitment and getting the right people in so they know exactly what they're going to take on. And secondly, it's the retention which you've touched on, uh, losing those experienced officers. It's sometimes one year people go, well, they're, they're just it's not what they thought and, and left. But 11 years, now that is worrying because you've got quite an experienced police officer then and you want to keep those. Now, in the late 70s, the Lord Evan Davis report came in and it was aimed at uh, the rewards being higher for the longer you stayed in. And I think it's going to need something like that, an inducement, yeah. to keep those experienced officers in yeah. before they go looking yeah. elsewhere. Thank um, you. It's a very good point. That experience, that help to younger officers is absolutely crucial and you need to keep your workforce together. Absolutely. Hamish Brown, MBU, former Met Police Detective, thank you for your thoughts on that. Let's come to Benedict Spence. I mean, look, police have had a, a very rough ride uh, in recent years in terms of you know, the, the politicisation, the policing, uh, a lot of the woke nonsense, which I know most officers on the ground are horrified by yeah. it as well. But also, of course, you know, Wayne Cousins and, and other officers being found uh, guilty of the most heinous crimes, particularly, you know, these massive investigations into whether or not the right particularly men were being recruited mm. uh, and retained in the, in the force how, how do we resolve this problem i think as you say you know the police have been in for a tough time and their lives have not been necessarily made easier i think by their political masters who don't necessarily prioritize the things that you would hope a police force would be there to prioritize and that is upholding people's rights law and order things like attending burglary thefts and actually investigating these sorts of things um, i think when you look at the sheer number of those kind of low-level crimes that go unsolved and also when you look at the number of, for example uh, sexual assault Assaults and that, the crimes of that nature that don't get thoroughly investigated. You have to see if you want to sort of rebuild trust in the police and actually get it to a position where it's still considered a good uh, yeah. career uh, path to take, there needs to be a, a reorganization of what the priorities of the police so are like, yeah. for the public and it, trust. Them. And it's not hurty tweets, everybody. Exactly. Just do, you know, FYI. Uh, right now, let's get back to the question I'm asking you today about uh, cigarettes. And uh, today we are asking you uh, about the government introducing this new law today. Um, the bill is coming into Parliament to ban anyone aged 14 or younger this year from ever being able to legally buy cigarettes. Do you agree or disagree with the ban? Tell us why. Give us a call, 0344 499 1000. Text 87222 or get in touch on X at Talk TV. Susan says, yes, where would a 14-year-old get access to money to smoke? If it's the parents, they are not up to the job of parenting. Yeah, they're, they're bumming them off their mates, aren't they? Uh, Stuart says, I disagree. As long as risks are known, then allow freedom of choice. How long will it be before they stop or control other things such as alcohol? Which is what we were saying. And Peter says, I disagree. I hate the anti-smoking agenda in general. Bring back smoking in pubs. Some of you have also been getting in touch on the phones. Keep those calls coming in. Let's go to John, who's in Kent. Hello, John. Hello, Julie. Kent. Good morning. Good morning. What Good do morning. you want to say? Do you do you agree with this uh, smoking ban? I'm totally opposed to it. I think we've had a nanny state for too many decades. I don't want to be told by an MP or anybody like that what's good and good for me and what I shouldn't do. If I want to eat a donut once a week or have a cigarette, yes. I think I should be entitled to. My father started when he was 16 in the yeah. 1930s. He started on wood pines. They used to be called coffin nails. Mm. And he smoked for most of his life. He finally decided to stop smoking at 82. 82? 
Yes, what he, what he finally, what time. finally made him give up at 82? I think he was worried about dying. Anyway, I said to him one day, I said, look, Dad, don't worry about the cigarettes. It, it won't, it's not going to be the cigarettes that finish you off. And do you know what? He lived to 91, nearly another 10 years. Yeah. And what killed him off was he caught norovirus in an NHS hospital. Yeah. John, I'm, so, I'm very sorry about you losing your father, but the, the reality is, and we just spoke to a retired radiologist, you know, that smoking does kill, but, you know, your chances of any kind of cancer, heart disease and other deaths are, are, are massively go up as a result of, of smoking. We know it's bad, but I'm not sure there's much point giving up at 82. I mean, I know that, I know that within three or four years of giving up, you, you, you do reap the, reap the benefits of that, uh, and perhaps even sooner, but, but your argument is that let people do what they want to do. Yes, because if you, if, you, if you ban cakes, for example, or ban cigarettes totally, or let's say they start saying hard liquor like whiskey, yeah. gin and vodka, if they ban that, they won't, of course, because of the tax, but where will be the pleasure to look forward to yeah. when you've done a hard day's work? There is a difference between alcohol and cakes and cigarettes, so every single cigarette's bad for you. Having a bit of cake or, or, or having a drink of alcohol is not bad for you. I don't care what there's nanny state. There's no evidence at all, scientifically, that they are bad for you. In fact, yeah. moderation, good for you. But, but cigarettes are oh, different. Yeah. Yes, yes, Julia. I think possibly, I mean, for my case, I know more people who've died from drink than, than tobacco. That's interesting. Many more. Yeah. So, John, sorry, thank you very much. I really appreciate your call. I, I love your dad giving up at 82. Then, and then, uh, and then uh, last get on 10. Uh, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Now, coming up after the break, former President of the United States, Donald Trump, says he is committed to keep America in NATO as long as European countries treat the US fairly. I'm Julia Hartley-Brewer, and you're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know, uh, it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, yeah. minutes, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer, and you are with Talk TV. Now, yesterday, former President Donald Trump was on the telly saying he's committed to keeping the US in NATO as long as European countries treat American fairly. Uh, he said that during an interview with Nigel Farage on GB News. Joining me right now to discuss this is Chairman of Republicans Overseas UK, Greg Spencer. Good morning to you. Thanks for joining us in the studio. Good to be here, Julia. Uh, and also Benedict Spencer still with here as well, with us as well. Let's play a couple of quick clips. Actually, we'll just play the first clip about um, NATO. Uh, this is Donald Trump, uh, who was asked uh, about you know, this, lots of concerns about if he does become president again, whether or not NATO would still be there to back up Europe, given since he was last in power, we have seen that invasion of Ukraine by Russia. Here is what Donald Trump had to say. The United States should pay its fair share, not everybody else's fair share. No, fair enough. I believe the United States was paying 90% of NATO, the cost of yep. NATO, could be 100%. Yep. It was the most unfair thing. And don't forget, it's more important to them than it is to us. We have an ocean in between some problems, okay? We have a nice, big, yeah. beautiful ocean. And it's more important for them. They were taking advantage, and they did. They took advantage of us okay. on trade, and they took advantage on So if the they military. play fair, if they start to play fair, America's there. Yes, 100%. Right, so if you all play fair, Greg Spencer, he's going to carry on making sure that uh, US funds NATO. Look, this is a genuine concern for a lot of European uh, members of NATO. Yeah, and I, I don't think it should be. It, it, if, if the European countries spend more money or a greater percentage of their GDP, if they hit the 2% target, then President Trump or any American president will be there. For, and and for an NATO. awful lot of countries weren't. I mean, Germany in sure, particular. We it, see some other countries like Poland up to, I think, 4% now. But right. it is, it, when he said this some years back when he was president, and, and the, the great and the good, and they were like, of course. Oh, clutch their pearls about how awful it was that he wasn't committed. No, he's making the point that, you know, why should America be committed to NATO, which is about saving Europe yeah. from, from Russia or anyone? Um, when, when Europe isn't committed. Right, and, and it would be better for, the, for, the, for Europe, for NATO ex-US, to be less dependent. You know, they, yeah. they shouldn't be treated like children. And well, it's just some really... of them, Emmanuel Macron is very keen yeah. on, the French president is very keen and, on having a sort of European army and, right. and, 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 want, and wants to do this so we're not so reliant. That's right. When Trump started bantering about this in 2017, 18, there were only five countries meeting the target. Now there is 11 and it's going to 18 by the yeah. end of 2000, by the end of this year. So, uh, yeah. you know, progress. So that's But, but as news. per usual, you know, a lot of people accuse me of Trump derangement syndrome, but I don't know. I did, Not I criticize you. him when I think he's done something wrong or says something wrong, uh, or his character, I think that's fair to criticize. But, but when he said stuff like this, oh, I always said, no, he sure. was completely fair to make this point. Um, in terms of where we are in the election now, of course, yeah. you know, since we last spoke, you know, he is going to be, I mean, unless something massive changes, the Republican nominee right. for president and we're going to have of course the the conventions in the summer for formally making joe biden the democrat nominee mm -hmm. and and donald trump the republican um do you think there is any possibility after all of you know the shenanigans we've seen um given given all the criminal charges where if any of these cases do and they're getting delayed each time they're coming forward they're getting there are four sets of, uh, yeah. of of trials he's facing that any of those will actually happen before the November election day and that he will be convicted in any of those? And if that happens, will that stop him winning the presidency? Yeah, possibly. So but all these different stages. There are a number of voters who have indicated in polling that they will, will not, and it, that number could be 5 to 10 percent of Republicans that will not vote for him if there's a conviction. However, that's the sentiment now. The, yeah. more, this go, the, the more this drags on, the more shenanigans that you're seeing from the, the prosecutors, whether it's Alvin Bragg or Fannie Willis, mm -hmm. that the better it is for Trump. So I'm not sure that that metric is going to stay. And, and yet he is very keen, his lawyers constantly just pushing these trials further away yeah. and further away and, and asking for another date and another date because he doesn't want a conviction uh, while right. while he is and, uh, and, still running. For, now, part of that is because the impact of the election, but also sure. if, if he does become president before any of these trials start, which is totally possible, mm -hmm. Those trials won't go ahead then until after he is is in office. In theory, yes. And of course, he can't run for a third term under the right. U.S. Constitution. Right. And, and and look, these things, for the most part, they're backfiring. Right. There, there's not a lot of credibility to several, to at least three of the four. And the one that does have some credibility is the documents case. But you have to look at it in the context of how they're handling President Biden's case, which basically yeah. they're giving him a pass on it. 
because of his cognitive And that's the thing issues. where this all becomes politicised and everyone's yeah. already decided already. So, Let me also bring another clip of what Donald Trump yeah. had to say to Nigel Farage yesterday. Uh, and this was in relation to Prince Harry, always in the news. And, of course, there's been a lot of moves in, in American circles to try and get the details of Prince Harry's visa application. Yeah. Because, of course, to get a, a US visa to live in America, you, you can't have uh, done drugs and things like that. You have to sign a document saying that you, you have not used a classy drugs, broken the law, etc., etc. And then he writes a whole biography, <laughs> spare, in which he admits doing huge amounts of illegal drugs. Let's have a watch and a listen of what Donald Trump had to say about Prince Harry. And we'll have to see uh, if they know something about the drugs and if he lied, you'll have to take appropriate action. Appropriate action? Yeah. Which might mean not staying Oh, I don't know. You'll have to tell me. You just <laughs> have to tell me. You'll just have to tell me it is interesting there. I mean, look, you know, w would he realistically, you know, throw Prince Harry out of America, do I, you think? I can't imagine that he would do that. He might even take the opportunity to give him a pass or give him a pardon. But I thought, I thought the president was pretty smart last night. He, he turned that into not just judging on Harry, but he talked about, you know, what the relationship was with, with the Queen, as well as the fact that- It was full of praise for the He was disappointed yeah. in Harry that, that he disappointed the Queen. So I, I thought he did a, a good job handling that. Look, I mean, look, he, he, doesn't, I mean, he doesn't really care what, what British people think of him, but really, does he? Because, it, you know, they, we, we don't get a vote. Although there are Americans living here who get a vote, I'm guessing they probably all decided themselves. Yeah. I thought it was a much less sort of bombastic Donald Trump than we've seen yeah. in, in recent interviews. I thought he was much more measured. He was. He, he wasn't unfiltered as he is when he does the rallies or when he does the one-off press conferences. So was that because Nigel Farage and they're, they're friends and there was they a are, bit yeah. Of... I mean, you could you could see that it was a you know they was, have a, was... they have a relationship. Yes. it was not a hard you know it wasn't a hard driving you know really pressure. Uh, type of interview. Well, we know what happens when that happens. Donald Trump walks out. <laughs> so. walk. Benedict Spence, yeah. what did you make of it? I'm just really happy that he's running again. I can't lie. <laughs> Everything's going horribly wrong in this country, but it puts everything into perspective. Um, it, was a, it was an interesting interview. I, I mean, it is that sort of thing where, as you say, he doesn't necessarily care about what British voters think, but he did. I think it was very important <laughs> to him, the sort of the pageantry and the sort of the prestige <laughs> of being seen with members of the royal family. So I think it is curious yeah. that he's going to sort of try and be a bit measured about this, maybe play it for a future state you know, visit or you know, quid pro quo, if we keep him here. Can well, I, can no, I he only wanted that? the state visit for the Queen, didn't I he? I don't know. No. Although you think he'll want it, I, mean, I don't, I don't he think he'll really have that much it. interest in King Charles. He'll want it, he'll want it for Kate and well, he's, William. He was, I thought he was complimentary of King Charles as well. Yeah. And, and remember, Trump came for two visits. The one was the state visit, yeah. but the prior year in 2018, he came. Uh, oh, of course, and, yeah. And well, so we should wait and see. The UK. All to play for uh, yeah. Greg Swenson from Republic of Services UK. Thank you so much. That's always coming up in the next hour. The Data Watchdog is investigating a major security breach with the Princess of Wales and will bring you the highlights, if there are any, from PMQ. So I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know, uh, it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested 
Alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you know? laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good afternoon. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer, and you are with Talk TV. We're on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. And I'm with you live from 10 until 1. Coming up in this hour, the Daily Watchdog is investigating a major security breach for the Princess of Wales after reports that staff at her private hospital in London tried to gain unauthorised access to her medical records. This comes as new polling shows that over half of the British public have seen those conspiracy theories about her health. Meanwhile, the government plans to house asylum seekers on barges and disused military bases could cost millions more than keeping them in hotels. That's according to a government watchdog. This comes as the Archbishop of Canterbury has backed calls for asylum seekers to be allowed to work, I kid you not, from the day they arrive in Britain. Oh, yes, and get loans to help them set up businesses. Is this man clinically insane? Uh, next up, also, Prime Minister's questions. They're already underway in Westminster. We will bring you all the highlights, assuming, always on this proviso, that there are any with Peter Carwell. First, though, let's get the latest news headlines with Bhavani Vade. Good afternoon. We begin with some breaking news. Ireland's Prime Minister, Leo Varadkar, has announced he's standing down. Varadkar became Ireland's youngest TSOC in 2017. He's confirmed he will step down before the next general election and will also stand down as party leader. UK inflation has fallen to its lowest level for two and a half years. Figures from the Office for National Statistics show that the price of goods and services fell to 3.4% in February, down from 4% in January, and the lowest since September 2021. Meanwhile, tomorrow, the Bank of England is widely expected to hold interest rates at 5.2%. Flory 5.25%. The Chancellor says it's a big improvement during Rishi's time in power. And what this shows is that the plan to bring inflation down, it was over 11% when Rishi Sunak became Prime Minister, uh, now just 3.4%. That plan is working, but we do need to stick to it and see it right the way through. Bosses at a hospital where the Princess of Wales was treated have launched an investigation following claims staff tried to access her private medical records. The security breach happened at the London Clinic in January while she was a patient undergoing surgery there. The hospital is known for treating politicians and celebrities. The data watchdog is assessing the report and our royal editor Sarah Hewson told Talk Today the royal family were informed immediately. Obviously, we're told that Kensington Palace were made aware as soon as the allegations were raised. Why this is coming out now, we don't know uh, whether it has been known about and they've been trying to keep it uh, uh, under wraps. I don't know. But it is very, very serious indeed, because, you know, you are at your most vulnerable when you are in hospital. 
Nearly a quarter of police officers are planning to resign in the next two years. The Police Federation of England and Wales said 85% of those polled said they are not fairly paid given the dangers they face in the job, with 15% saying they'd suffered one or more injuries in the past year. More than 9,000 officers have left the service in the year to March 2023. Former Met Police Detective Peter Blexley says it's a perfect storm that will affect the service significantly. As much as they're trying to shovel brand new officers in through the front door, officers are leaving through the back door, not only because of pay, but because they're poorly trained, so they're not, they're not ready to fight crime when they get onto the front line. There's no experience to show them how to do it. The supervision and management is awful a lot of the time. And, of course, morale is absolutely on the floor. The National Audit Office has revealed that it is in fact cheaper to house asylum seekers in hotels than in any of the government's planned alternatives. The Home Office wants to put them in barges and former RAF bases, but apparently it will cost the taxpayer £46 million more. And actor Aaron Taylor-Johnson has squashed rumours that he is to be the next James Bond. The kick-ass and Marvel film star said he had no desire to become part of the pop culture studio machine in an interview with Rolling Stone magazine. He said he was honoured to be considered, but that he didn't want his brand to become all about action films. Well, that's the latest. Now time for a look at today's weather with Nazneen Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello. Mild for many this afternoon. Sunshine for some, mainly across Scotland and Northern Ireland, but for others it's generally looking quite cloudy and rainy, mainly across Northern England into the Midlands, Eastern England, Wales and the West Country into this afternoon. Down towards the South East, there should be some good amounts of sunshine and it will be mildest there with temperatures locally up to 17 degrees Celsius, but also feeling pleasantly mild across parts of the North with the light winds and the sunshine for Scotland and Northern Ireland, where we'll probably see highs of around 12. Now, overnight, that front of rain will continue its journey further south and eastwards, most of it turning light and patchy in nature. It will be a mild, cloudy night across parts of central, southern and eastern England with Mr Merck forming. Clear spells further north and west before more wind and rain spreads to the far northwest of Scotland and Northern Ireland with severe gales likely then. It will be a cool night across parts of the north. And then over tomorrow we will continue to see that rain spread its way further eastwards across Scotland with some heavy downpours across the high ground of the west. Northern Ireland and the Republic becoming wet and northern England later too. But the rest of England and Wales will be mostly fine and bright and feeling mild in the south. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good afternoon and welcome back to the show. I'm Julia hartley Brew, and you are with Talk TV. With me going through all of the day's top stories is Conservative commentator Benedict Spence. Don't forget, we'll be looking at the highlights, assuming there are any, uh, from uh, PMQs with Peter Carpwell, our chief political commentator, a little bit later in the show. Um, just some breaking news for you before we get into other topics. So Leo Varadkar, uh, of course, who's the Prime Minister, the Taoiseach of um, the Republic of Ireland, has announced that he is to step down before the next general election. Also, not just as Prime Minister, but also leader of the governing uh, Fianna Gael party. Uh, it was an unexpected move. Uh, his departure of the three-party coalition that currently rules in Republic of Ireland doesn't automatically trigger a general election and he could be replaced by whoever is the new uh, leader of that party. This does come though, Benedict Spence, um, you know, just a week or so after losing that, the government lost that referendum, they'd pushed for changing the constitution in, in the Republic of Ireland. Um, one was about sort of the role, the, due, the amazing, amazing clauses in their constitution about, you know, the role of women, are, the, the women's duties in the home, which I certainly would vote to change, but also basically completely undermining the role of, you know, married couples and the family, the, the, the traditional family unit. Yeah. These were rejected, you know, by around 70% by the, the, the public in Ireland. Do you think that will have played a part in him choosing to step down? I think it will. I also think uh, that increasing unhappiness around things like immigration in Ireland, you know, we talk about it a lot in the UK, but yeah. it's happening a lot in Ireland It's happening as well. across but the whole there Europe, were, yeah. Well, there were riots in Dublin, weren't there, a couple of uh, months back on the basis of an attack by a migrant or something, and the press's insistence, oh, no, this was an Irish citizen and therefore had to be 
to refer to as Irish, and people got very angry about it. And we often talk about sort of the, the disconnect between British political and media elites and the rest of the country. I think that that gulf is a lot wider in Ireland, which I think people, you know, just because it's a sort of a vaguely post-Catholic country does not mean, yeah. you know, Catholicism does not die that quickly overnight. I think a lot of very but social, conservative attitudes are still ingrained. Well, and they, they voted like for, you know, yeah, you know, le you know, legalizing abortion and gay sure. rights, and, it's, and, and they're very, very, very pro-EU, because you would sure. be if your country had received billions and billions of pounds mm. from EU funds, i.e. from Britain, because that we were, we were always a net contributor, not yeah. a net taker. Um, but again, as that changes with the poorer East European countries, not quite such a good deal. But it is mm. interesting. Very conservative country. You know, the, you, know, you know, it's all about the Catholic Church and the power they had. It's almost like a new religion of woke. Uh, in, in Ireland, but I don't think most people will... I, again, like with like in this country, the political elite, elite they're, yeah. they're going along with that, but actually, the, the largely, the public are going, no, thanks, that's not what we want. Well, it's interesting that you raise the spectre of Eastern Europe, because, of course, they famously refer to them leaving the Soviet bloc and joining the European Union as the Grey Revolution, because, actually, they just replaced one form of bureaucracy yep. with another, which suppressed their national identities, and they were very unhappy about that. So yep. you, you often have to be careful about what you wish for with these sorts of things. Well, indeed, I'm always amazed. It's like, you know, <laughs> countries... Like, no, like Scotland saying, like, we, oh, we, we want to leave Britain, yes. leave the subjugation <laughs> of Westminster for the subjugation Brussels. of Brussels. I mean, okay, you, you know, pick, mm. pick a fighter, anyone. But anyway, let's also talk about um, the smoking ban. We, this was trailed by the Prime Minister in his speech to party conference in October. And this is a, a new law, and it's being brought into the Commons today uh, to ban anyone aged 14 or younger this year. So if you're born uh, uh, since 2009, sorry, sorry, before, before yeah, since 2009, um, you for your ban from ever being able to legally buy cigarettes. Now, even if you're under 18 right now, mm. <laughs> you, you're still banned from legally buying cigarettes and somehow they all seem to be able to get hold of them if they want them. I want to know, do you agree or do you disagree with this ban? Tell us what you do, tell us why you don't. You can give us a call on 0344 499 text on 87222, or get in touch on X at Talk TV. Calls to charge at the national rate. Text costs one standard network rate message. And it's interesting, Benedict, the calls we've had on this so far and the messages, a lot of people saying, I don't want the nanny state. What are they going to move on to next? Yeah. Is it going to be alcohol and things? That's something you've raised. But then we had a, a retired radiologist who, who's, uh, you know, whose own sister had died from smoking and say, look, you know, you've got to ban these things because you've got to have a change of culture because, you know, people die from smoking. The thing is, I, I think smoking is terrible. I think mm. cigarettes are terrible. I would, if they came onto the market now, they, there's no way they'd win a licence. They are literally cancer sticks. That's what... One cigarette is bad for you, not 100. Yeah. One cigarette is bad for you. But they exist. We have them now. You're not going to get rid of them that quickly. Have we not had enough of a change in culture I mean, already that I, we don't need to get our knickers in a twist about it? I mean, look, you can't have a situation where you have one 18-year-old and one person who's 18 in a day and one person can buy a cigarette and the other legally can't. That's just an answer. That's literally what the law yeah. is going to so bring So what in. it will end up being is, therefore, it is the pathway towards a blanket ban. Do blanket bans work? No, they don't. We saw this with prohibition in the United States. Yeah. We also saw this on the importing of Cuban cigars. They still find a way. What you do is you then push it into the hands of criminal gangs. Criminal gangs in this country are very effective at getting much worse substances yeah. onto the streets to the point where the police don't bother to actually you, arrest I can people. get you cigarettes or yeah. I can get you these other stuff which is much more addictive. And, but this is the thing, we want if people mm. are going to be buying cigarettes, we want it to still be legal and also yeah. we can get the taxes. Um, 16, 15, 16 quid for a packet of cigarettes now legally. But also, uh, you know, but a lot of people are getting them off the back of a lorry. Here's mm. the thing though, I mean, at the end of, at the, end of the day, no one who is smoking right now is yeah. not aware of the risk. Even the 14-year-old who is starting, who's illegally buying their cigarettes, is buying a packet of cigarettes that has got pictures of someone's disgusting, you know, uh, diseased nicotine lung. diseased yeah. lung on it. I mean, for goodness sake, they, they know it. People have got full information. Now, look, I, I, don't, I, I think you should enforce the laws for under-18s. I mean, so rigidly. I mean, mm. like, you sell, um, you sell cigarettes to one under-18-year-old, you get a £50,000 fine. It's, it's, and your, your licence is gone mm. to do anything the next, the next time. Be really, really strict on it. But at the end of the day, kids are going to do stuff they're not allowed to do. Yeah. I, I, I was drinking when I was that age. Most people I know were. I'd rather kids were vaping, and we're banning that for, you know, yeah. that's banned for kids. I would rather a kid vaped than they smoked, 
or as people were doing in my day, sniffed glue. Yeah, and I think the thing to remember is actually, if we're talking about this prohibition at the exact same time, but there's also a movement to try to legalize certain other drugs. And I have to sit there and say, yeah. right, what's the logic about this? Cigarettes are bad for you, great. Marijuana is also really bad for you, but a lot of people seem really keen that we should be able to legalize it. So which direction are we going? Does yeah. prohibition work or doesn't it work? Yeah, it, it does, yeah, it's, it's depending on what people... You exactly, know. what's your, what's your which, point? Which, yes, what is your preferred nanny state issue, indeed? I'd love to get your thoughts, do get in touch, particularly on the phone. So three double four four double nine one thousand is the number to call. Right now, let's turn our attention back to uh, migrants, illegal migrants, asylum seekers, because they're never out of the news. The Rwanda bill, of course, uh, is back in the House of Laws, and they're going to be trying to uh, bring in more of those amendments back, which the MPs have just struck out. Will those planes ever take off? Well, who knows? What we do know is that the vast majority of people who come here in this country, to this country illegally and who claim asylum aren't processed for many, many months, even years. Yet the government plans to, on, to house asylum seekers on barges, not just the baby Stockholm, but other barges, but also disused military bases, could end up costing millions more, millions and millions more uh, than keeping them in hotels, more than to the tune of more than 40 million quid. That's according to the government watchdog, the National Audit Office. And this comes as the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, has backed calls for asylum seekers to be, wait for it, allowed to work from the day they arrive in Britain. Oh, and even be having access to government funds to set up their own businesses. You couldn't make this stuff up. It's not April the 1st, it really isn't. Joining me right now to discuss this is George Pitcher, who's a priest in the Church of England, and also a former advisor to the former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams. Thank you so much for joining us, George. Hello, Julia Hello. Hardy. Oh, lovely to be with you again. I'm sorry, what were you calling me? Yeah. I've, I've been called many things in my time, George. Uh, but... Not they all do that. Yeah. <laughs> if they can, yeah. <laughs> um, George, look, let me ask you. I mean, let's just talk about the Archbishop of Canterbury. He's part of this interfaith, independent commission on the integration of refugees, along with the chief rabbi and, and, um, and imams and cardinals, and, and etc. And they're calling for changes. They want... They say to have, you know, free English language lessons from day one, the right uh, to work in the, the, the jobs where there is a shortage on the shortage occupation list from day one, certainly the right to employment generally after six months and the right to get government backed finance schemes to help set up their own businesses. This is, I would say, borderline insanity, if not outright insanity, from these faith leaders. This will basically just say, come on over, we'll look after you. Do you think the Archbishop and, and these others have got, got this horribly wrong? Uh, no, of course not. That's why you have me on, because I take a very different view to you, uh, Julia. Um, I'm very pleased, I'm glad, I'm celebrating today that uh, somebody, somebody in a position of authority is trying to mend our hopelessly broken asylum system because our government sure as eggs isn't. Um, the, uh, all the government appears to be doing is posing with various sort of dog whistle uh, efforts at trying to get planes off the ground to Rwanda, uh, making statistical to statistically insignificant changes to the numbers of immigration. What is clear is that we need, uh, we need more efficient and effective processing yep. of asylum claims much more quickly, and that is contained within today's report. And um, it's, it's terrifically important too that we um, help immigrants to integrate. The right wing of our politics is forever mooing on about how immigrants don't integrate with our society. And then as soon as we uh, produce a policy to enable that integration, they throw their hands up in horror and go, oh my God, they're integrating. Uh, yeah, I think I think the issue there is about government money, well, which is taxpayers' money being used for people when other people are already here in this country are, are struggling. But this, you say, this is about mending our asylum system. All this will do is say, hey, come over to Britain. The deal is even better. Not only are you going to be put in some, you know, three-star hotel uh, for the period of time, you're going to be able to work, even legally. You're not even going to be beholden to the gangs to get them work on the black market. Um, absolutely fine. You're going to be integrated. We know that that will then enable people to say, I'll put down roots, I'm here to stay. That basically says, here is a green light. You may as well, I mean, you may as well just set up a ferry service from, 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 from Calais to Dover, and we'll just we'll just welcome them all in. I mean, we'll have we'll have millions turning up, not just the tens of thousands we currently have. 
Oh, well, we need immigrants to um, do the jobs no, in don't. our society. Okay, that, no, no, um, no, 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 George, I'm going to stop you there. A, there's a difference to. between immigrants and illegal arrivals. That's different. Yeah. Someone who's mm -hmm. coming here, who's well-educated, who's got great skills, who wants to come here and set up their life and applies for a visa legally and wants to make their life here and is welcoming... That's quite different from people arriving... The people applying for asylum are largely arriving illegally. Well, the, the, the ones arriving for asylum are the ones pre, pre, predominantly on the small boats, aren't they? Yes, dear? illegally. The numbers of those are st statistically insignificant. Not, now, not, uh, if, again, not the if those young men are being yeah, housed in a hostel yeah, at the end of your road. Be, what, three quarters of a million this year or something? We might get 70,000, 75,000 arriving in small boats. Now, the small boats must stop. There we agree, Julia. Well, they're not going it's to stop. It's dangerous, it's costing lives. And no, the no, no, but George, they're not stop. going to stop if you're saying, we'll give you English lessons, we'll give you money to set up a business, or we'll, 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 uh, we'll, you can get a job. They're the not, that, what the what about stop, that, says deterrence? The way to stop small boats hasn't appeared to uh, have been achieved um, by government policies so far. Do you remember you. the hostile environment for immigrants? How did that go under Theresa May? Um, wave machines from one of our that former nonsense, home secretaries. Yes. Now Rwanda doesn't even appear to be happening, let alone be a disincentive. So we need to find a way to tackle illegal immigration. Yes, but how does offering and more... In... No, but George, more George, you, these are, George, these are lovely words. I'm sure, George, these are lovely words. And this is the thing. Everyone can sit in their nice home saying these are lovely words. At the end of the day, how does this... You say this, they, they're saying this is about mending the asylum system. How does offering more incentives to people to come to this country illegally, risking their lives on these boats, paying people traffickers, how does offering them more incentives to come here make, mend that issue? What, what I'm saying here, Julia, is that the proportion of our overall immigration yes. is, is, is the, the, the proportion of that, which is illegal, illegal. immigration very in small, small boats, is it tiny. Is. That needs to be tackled. And one of the ways that the overall immigration situation can be tackled, and by the way, overall, one in three of our immigrants have a degree, and we and this scheme, carefully budgeted by ec economists, will pay for itself within three years. Well, I don't think you'll say that about Rwanda, which isn't even affected. No, no, I, I agree with you on Rwanda. Can I point out, there are plenty of people who come to this country who have degrees. Unfortunately, they have degrees that aren't recognised, in qualifications that aren't recognised in this country, and often someone who might work as a teacher in another country or, or a medic is unfortunately working as a cleaner or an Uber driver in this country. Now, we can tackle those issues there. I think there's an issue between illegal immigration and... And, and legal immigration. This particular report is about the asylum system, which deals with, deals with people who've arrived here largely illegally. The debate about how many people should be given visas and whether or not we should train up our own people to do jobs rather than importing them from third world countries largely, I think is a different debate. How, I'm asking you again, how does offering more incentives to people to take that risky journey across the channel, how does offering them even more benefits, how does that deter them? Julia, this is worth costed by the economists behind this report. This is worth £1.6 billion to the uh, British economy uh, within uh, five years. Um, I'm quite keen that we should. So you're uh, saying illegal migrants, illegal migrants are going to be benefiting our economy? Can you answer the question I've actually asked you, George? I know, I mean, I don't mean to be, be rude, but. About the people applying for asylum and what Justin Welby and others think that they, 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 what the uh, benefits they should be, be able to access. Answer that question. Ille legal migration is a separate matter. Illegal. Illegal migration is that proportion of the overall immigration, uh, which is proportionately tiny. You've said that three times that now. Could you answer through, the question I've asked you? And efficient processing. And with effective and efficient processing, yes. you've already said in the introduction that it takes months for this government to organise any processing whatsoever. That's true. The report said that this is all predicated on a new system that will process uh, all uh, asylum claims uh, within six months.
Yeah, I mean, I'm uh, amazed it that, takes six months. Look, we'd met, agree on that. And there are systems in which that can be met. I have to say it's made a lot more, it's made a lot harder by Brexit, of course, but we can, well, within why, six why? months, why? process it, any why is asylum it made hard? Thing. I mean, I knew you had to get this in because you work in the Church of England. Why does, why does Brexit make it harder? Well, uh, Julia, if only we had some pan-European federation that we could be a member of so that we could be sorting this out with neighbouring mm. countries. The situation it... at the moment is yeah. that France has no incentive to help us why not? with migration why from not? France, precisely no, why not? because those migrants are leaving France. Yeah, but they only They're go to France Europe. to get to us. Sorry, we managed to do a return deal with Albania. Albania isn't even in the EU and, and we, we're not in a federation with them and yet we're able to do a deal with them. We're able to do deals with other countries on security and defence, do lots of things. We're able to cooperate with the uh, with France and the rest of the EU on, uh, on, on, on backing for Ukraine. But, but for some reason we're unable to do a deal on dealing with illegal migrants but it's all to do with those ghastly well, awful to, people like me who go to Brexit. You'd have to terrible Home Secretaries I've had. Well, we can't do a deal with France. And one of the reasons we can't deal, deal with France is precisely because France has no particular interest in it. I mean, so, it, it so sees migrants leaving Europe. So what's that got to do with us being in the EU? Europe, leaving what's that Europe, to... Julia, so, for Britain. So, so if we were members of the EU tomorrow, would Macron, Macron suddenly go, oh, brilliant, I'll have all those people back then? Of course he wouldn't. Those, those returns had already failed long before uh, we'd uh, left the European Union. But they the were going down for years beforehand. The proportion of the small proportion that are illegal migrants on boats, if, they're, if their asylum claims are processed efficiently and yes. effectively within six months, then they can either be returned to their, um, their country No, or, they can't because origin. they don't bring documentation. Well, yeah, but how many do you think that is? Well, we're talking 90% the, right, the three quarters of a million that come here, you as you rightly say, that, but, they, the but we know who Europe, they are and they're here legally. And could be contributing 1.6 billion to our exchequer, which I rather like the thought of. Well, again, again, the figures that we've heard for years about, by the way, how legal migrants are contributing money, actually the vast majority are not net contributors. And by the way, if mass immigration was such a fabulous thing for this country and produced amazing growth, then we wouldn't be in the economic mess we're in now and have been for the last 20 years when we've had a wide open door policy, when we were in your wonderful, fantastic, perfect EU. On that note, George, I'm giving up, signing out, because I've got to go to another topic. But, George, Pitcher, I really appreciate <laughs> you joining us. Do come on again. I couldn't disagree with you more on all this, but it's been a pleasure. Well, He's a priest of the Church of England. Always, a... It's always a pleasure, Julia. <laughs> and, um, Former advisor to, to another uh, Archbishop of Canterbury who always talked nonsense. That was Rowan Ro Ro Williams, not just Justin Wilby. Sorry to talk over you there, George, but Benedict uh. Spence, save me. I, 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 I was almost <laughs> sent, just the, the talking points, the same talking points. Oh, it's all Brexit's fault. Oh, we could do it. Benefit of immigrants. You know, Italy and France are both in the same union, and France still has border disputes to the point where the Italian ambassador gets recalled every now and then because actually they don't get along. You know, Holland, uh, sorry, Denmark has hundreds of thousands of people that Germany yeah. just waved on through, and Denmark can't get rid of them. Yeah. You know, it d doesn't. And this work was a that problem. Way. This was an issue in terms of returns long before we left the EU. Sorry, um, we don't just call it the EU. The ah, oh, I mean, it's just like it has got religious. <laughs> status for many in the church of England, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, it's, dearie yeah, honest, me. But, you know, it, it's fine. There are some people on this that you simply cannot persuade otherwise. And yeah. you're always into great, you know, great territory when they're discussing, you know, cherry-picked economic figures from however oh, long yeah. ago. Again, yeah, this everybody is Everybody can find uh, figures to support yeah, their position. But, but also, for evidence. years we've been told, for years we've been told, like, mass immigration, yeah. legal immigration, people come from the EU, and everything, that was a massive benefit, again, from mm. in the Indian subcontinent, Africa. I'm sorry, that there are very few countries from where we, when people arrive mm. from here, from, from there to our country, are actually, as a population, are net Contributors. That's yeah. not to say I don't. I'm not welcoming the people who come here who legally, who are who are making their their lives here and want a yeah. better life for themselves as long as it's done legally. Can I just come back to sure. the breaking news we had at the top of the hour? Leo Varadkar, the Irish Taoiseach, the Irish Prime Minister, uh, has announced that he's stepping down before the next election. Some say going before he has pushed an awful lot of uh, uh, leaders in, in recent years, discovering that ah, actually maybe not as popular as they thought they were. Uh, he has said um, in a press conference in the last few moments that his reasons for stepping down are both personal and political. He has. No plans lined up, uh, but he will say he said he will actually leave office as soon as uh, a, a new leader of the Fine Gael party mm. is 
uh, announced. Uh, right now, let's go back to the question we've been asking about uh, to you today. And the government announced this new law, well, introducing, sorry, new law, they announced it back in October, a party conference, but it's being introduced to the Commons today to ban anyone aged 14 or younger this year from ever being able to legally buy cigarettes. I want to know, do you agree or disagree with the ban? And tell us why you do, why tell us why you don't. Give us a call, 03444991000, text on 8722, or get in touch on X at Talk TV. Oliver has done just that and says, over the top control, first this, then what? It will lead to another law and another law. The government works for the people, not the other way around. <laughs> if only, uh, James says, the government needs to stop banning things. They have no right to tell us who can and can't smoke. People are way too accepting of the government deciding everything we do. And Daisy says, what about freedom of choice? Also, how much is the future government going to lose in tax revenues? I really don't see it happening. Yeah, that's the point. They still rely on cigarettes for a lot of tax revenues. Uh, let's go to the phone lines now. Do keep those calls coming in. Let's go to another Julia in Tilbury. Hello, Julia. Hello, Julia. Yeah, Good you've got a great you know. name. We're bound to agree. Yes, <laughs> what do you I want agree. to say? I, I think it's wrong to ban smoking because if you ban it, criminals will take over they selling do. cigarettes. Yeah. Yes, well, they're not going to ban happened. smoking. They're just going to ban adults who happen to be below a certain age from ever being able to legally buy cigarettes. They'll still be allowed to smoke if they can get hold of them. Oh, yes, but then they'll get them... And, and instead of... Because they can't buy them legally out of the shop. Yeah. They'll get them in other ways. Yeah. Even if the government decided, which I can't see them doing, to ban selling cigarettes in shops, yeah. criminals will buy them from countries abroad yeah. and bring and the, them into Britain. Well, it's like people Banning going on those, those sort of booze works. cruise equivalents, didn't they? You'd go off and you'd buy like loads of packets of cigarettes, bring them back in the country, and then people would sell them to their mates. Yes, that's what happens. But can I say, I think people should pack up smoking Yep. I used to smoke, so I know how hard it is to pack up. Yep. I packed up about 15 years ago. I'm Isn't 74 you? in May, so really? I started when I was a teenager, so I smoked most of my life. I know how hard it is to pack up smoking. When I went to the doctors and got some tablets off him, and they were really good, and that's how I packed up. And that's I haven't it. had a cigarette for 15 years. Amazing. And but have you felt the uh, health improvement? Yes, but I will say, when I was smoking, if people who smoke say, most of them say, I don't want to stop smoking, I enjoy it. Yeah. A lot of those people that say that are actually saying, I can't pack up smoking yeah. because I'm addicted. Yeah. Now, I'll explain that. With me, when I was smoking, if there was a thunder and lightning storm going on and I ran out of milk or sugar, I'd say, I'll leave it to tomorrow. Exactly. But not the same. If I ran sinks. out of cigarettes, I would walk up the shop yep. in a thunder and lightning storm <laughs> to get a pack of cigarettes. And that's how addictive they are, exactly. Well, that, do you know yes. what's fascinating? How many people have got in touch today on text, t tweets and, and on the phone who, who are either smokers themselves or, 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 or sorry, ex-smokers or really anti-smoking like me, but still don't think there should be this, this new law brought in. Julia, pleasure to have spoken to you. Thank you very much for calling in and, uh, and, and good luck keeping off, those, the, keeping off the ciggies. Uh, coming up after the break, PMQs has been underway in Westminster. We'll bring you the highlights in just a few moments with Peter Carbwell. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer and you're on Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Quite yay. right, too. 
It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, did to, fail her. Yeah, it was supposed to was another era. That. She was 22, mm. was supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer, and you are with Talk TV. Now, Prime Minister's questions are underway in Westminster, and we are just about to bring you all of the highlights. Joining me right now is Talk TV's chief political commentator, Peter Caldwell. Hi. Uh, after this year, and of course, Benedict Spence is still with us. So, first question always when we do this were there any highlights? Uh, highlights is a strong word. Sure. Yeah, but there were certainly. <laughs> so, we're going to move on. <laughs> yes, I mean, last, last week, I mean, it was really, I mean, phew, they were really going for well, it. Well, it got pretty week. personal this week as well, yeah. actually, in the second clip I'm going to show you, because Rishi Sunak uh, is definitely putting up the attacks on Starmer's sort of personal record and yeah. that he's defended. Because Starmer was definitely won last week, there's yes. no doubt at all. These are the set piece moments in the House of Commons. But look, this, the men are coming into this, the two party leaders, and they, they're coming into this from very different positions in their parties. Keir Starmer, way ahead yeah. in the polls, looking to be the next prime minister. Rishi Sunak facing another weekend of talk about whether or not he's going to survive even until the elections party. And actually, there's quite a good question from uh, the leader of the SNP, Westminster leader, Stephen Flynn. He's said, very good, he though. He's he a is, great he, performer. He, 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 always, he always has a bit of a zinger, and he said, which one of the born-again Thatcherites on the Labour benches does uh, Rishi Sunak think would be a good replacement for him? Which I thought was, was, was quite a good one. So, yes. so what's the first clip we're going to Well, the first clip is, is really about uh, the sort of what Keir Starmer sees as the litany of failures, and he's asking again, why won't Rishi Sunak call an election? I think we're going to see this uh, ramping up probably in each PMQs in regard to but, him but, saying call an election. But if an election isn't likely to be till October, I mean, we're mm. going to have this every week. I mean, yes. we'll, we'll be looking forward to the summer recess, won't we? Let's have a wash and listen <laughs> of that particular exchange. Mr Speaker, violent prisoners released early because the Tories wrecked the criminal justice system. Three and a half thousand small boat arrivals already this year because the Tories lost control of the borders. Yeah. The NHS struggling to see people because the Tories broke it. Millions paying more on their mortgages. A budget that hit pensioners. A £46 billion hole in his sums. Why is the Prime Minister so scared to call an election? Yeah. Well, Mr. Speaker, Mr Speaker, as I said in January, my working assumption is that the election will be in the second half of the year. But I must say, I thought that out of everybody, he'd actually be the most grateful, Mr Speaker, because he's now actually got time to come up with a plan for Britain. 
That, I mean, God, we're going to be hearing so much yeah, about this, aren't we? Be a lot of fun. Dave, we've got no plan, but look at the state that the, 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 the Tories are in. But I say, it is a point I wrote in, in, in an article this week for The Sun, which is that whatever happens at the next election, whoever wins, and even if it's a different Tory leader who is elected, uh, if, if the Prime Minister is ousted before the next general election, and if Keir Starmer wins in, in October, whenever it is, it's the same stuff in the interim. Mm. Nothing, mm. there is going to be no major change other than possibly something very bad, like, yes. you know, a, a, an invasion of a NATO country or something by Russia, that, or, or another shock on, on energy prices. There is going to be nothing that is going to fundamentally change yeah. whoever's in charge. And, and that was essentially a lot of the points that Rachel Reeves was actually making at her May's lecture last night, a big, uh, prestigious economic mm. lecture, where she said, look, the era of big government is essentially here, was, was basically what she was saying possibly looking ahead to taxes going up um, because yeah. public services Surprise. are in such a... Well, exactly, <laughs> are in such a bad state. But I think we saw today not just the macro issues, but also the personal attacks ramping up in regard to these exchanges. In this second clip, it's interesting that Rishi Sunak talked about specific people that Keir Starmer had defended as, uh, as a lawyer as well. Yeah, and again, that's always... I mean, we've had that against Sadiq Khan as well. Mm -hmm. But, like, lawyers do actually defend people, either as... Sometimes they have to. That, that's, you know, there's the this job. taxi rag, yeah, you know? Yeah. That, that's the next job that comes up, and you get it. Also, I still want bad people being defended. Yes, because then that means the justice system the, works, and it, it's fair. It, it, exactly. It's, yeah, I've got, let, well, let's have a watch and listen to that exchange. Speaker, I've prosecuted more people smugglers... <laughs> Rwanda gimmick is going to cost the taxpayer two million pounds for every one of his 300 people that they deport. When it comes to this question of how to deal with people who are here illegally, his values are simply not those of the British people. After all, this is the person who campaigned to stop the deportation of foreign dangerous criminals, Mr Speaker. A dangerous criminal was jailed for dealing Class A drugs after he fought to keep him here. A gangmaster was convicted of carrying a knife after he fought to keep him here. So whether it's representing terrorists or campaigning for criminals, it's clear whose side he's on, and it's not the British people. Well, that's an interesting exchange, you know, as you say, talking about you know their, their histories, good or bad, in, in, in terms Keir of... Keir Starmer called it desperate stuff and said it was yeah. a shame that Rishi Sunak was being diminished to this level. I, I want to know, who, who's been on a helicopter ride? But it's expensive <laughs> if you've been on a helicopter. That was, of course, a little dig at Frank Hester, the Tory donor, 10 million quid, possibly another 5 million, who's made these outrageous racist comments about Diane Abbott. Um, uh, and he, of course, paid, paid thousands of pounds worth of helicopter rides for David... Uh, helicopter Dr. or holocopter? Holi helicopter. Holi <laughs> from now on, that's what we're it's calling a holocopter. them. No, either way, I can't afford one. A uh, helicopter <laughs> ride uh, 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 for, for, the, for, the, for Rishi Sunak. Uh, but expense, what do you make of the exchange, especially when they sort of talk about your past, um, you know, your past job, your mm. past experience, and these sort of very personal attacks? People aren't stupid. They do know what lawyers do. They do know how the justice system works. And I think that they don't actually look at Keir Starmer's record and go, this is a reason not to vote for him. I think they look at lots of other things and go, I'm not particularly enthused. But I think, you know, that, that kind of attitude, which is that I know things are bad, but trust me, they're going to get way worse from, from uh, the Conservatives, makes it all the more sort of outrageous, frankly, that there is so little sort of gumption, so little desire to want to change. So, great swathes of the party, and we've been hearing it briefed, for months, people saying, "Oh well, maybe we need a period in opposition." You think, yeah. "Well, leave now, then." Get if, if you're a Tory and you're, yeah, if you genuinely are signed up to the ideology of conservatism and you think that's what's best mm. for the country, you have no business being in Parliament. If you think, "Let the other lot have a turn," no, you should leave straight away. And it's worth. Well, oh, but isn't the argument that let the other lot have a turn? That then, then everyone will appreciate but, us. I'm just not sure that's how again, it works. Again, this, this, we had over the weekend Ben Wallace saying, "Oh well, it's too we, too late to change the now. We need to walk towards the guns." You walk towards the guns. Well, he, well, he did. Leave. He's, he's always. He's already left a uh, public just office, isn't he? It's exactly. a disgrace. But Peter, look, we've had all these shenanigans over the weekend, and again, and some of it, look, is frankly just stirred up by mm. people, you know, putting out calls to journalists. And we know that, I know that both of the people making those calls. Um, but you know, is there genuinely a threat to the leadership of Rishi Sunak? There's some talk about how there may be as many as 40 letters of no confidence that have gone in the 1922 committee. To, but the only person who knows this will know exactly how many is Sir Graham Brady, the chair of that committee. Um, is there a genuine threat to the, the the job of the Prime Minister? I think he's under a lot of pressure. I think it could tip over if things go tremendously badly. We've seen the 
uh, inflation figures getting better now at 3.4%. Rishi Sunak will point to that. He's addressing MPs at 5 o'clock today, the 1922 backbench committee, and we'll see how they react to that, no doubt. The entire contents of that meeting will come out very shortly yeah, well, after. Well, within seconds. I mean, I mean yeah. Jonas literally standing Live at the tweeting. door uh, <laughs> listening to... Yeah, some we've had people are doing that. Can I ask you about Leo Varadkar, mm -hmm. obviously? Um, uh, he's, of course, the, currently the, the Taoiseach, the Prime Minister, Prime Minister of Ireland, uh, for a second time. Uh, he has announced and, and given a press conference in the last few minutes uh, saying that you know, he is standing down yeah. uh, as the Prime Minister. Um, what do we think brought this about? Because he said he's doing it for both personal and political reasons. Is he a popular figure? Is he not? He's just lost that big referendum last mm -hmm. week. What does that tell us? Two referendum, actually. Yeah, oh, it's yes. interesting because he has always said he'll step down b b between now and the time that he's 50. Uh, he said it's the most fulfilling time. How old is time. he now? He's, he's uh, I think he's in his late 40s anyway. But certainly we're in a situation where Irish politics is very, very much in flux. He's the head of a three-party coalition and they've uh, oscillated back between him and the other main party, Fianna Fáil, and they've had periods where he's been the Taoiseach and periods where Micheál Martin... Mm. Is this, deputy. by the way, is why I'm in favour of first-past-the-post politics. Yeah, have the the, yeah, set up the coalition before you go to the electorate. That's my, yeah. that's my view on that. But yes, he's stepping down. There will be a leadership election for Fianna Gael. They'll probably do that by their big conference, their Ardesh, in April. But this will mean big calls for an Irish election to be held earlier than it would have usually been held, which was meant to be like ourselves later in the year. OK, right. I just want to point out to people that you are filling in on the show. You're going to be in this seat mm. uh, on uh, Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday. That's and right. you're doing yep. other shows. Of course, you've got your brilliant show at the weekends as well. Uh, so you'll have plenty more of Peter Cardwell uh, next week. Don't share out at me. <laughs> you know what I'm doing. And actually I do today, it a lot. <laughs> to, today, Thursday and Friday as well, between three and four. Fantastic, wonderful stuff. Great. We, always good to get you on air more. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. Just stay there, though, while we get to uh, some more of our calls and texts, because uh, we're asking you about this uh, new law to ban anyone aged 14 or younger this year from ever being able to legally buy cigarettes. That We know about that from the Prime Minister in October at party conference, but that bill's going before MPs today. Do you agree or disagree with the ban? Tell us what you do. That's why you don't. Give us a call. 0344 499 1000. Text 87222 or get in touch on X at Talk TV. Colin says, absolutely ridiculous. You'll be needing a permit to breathe next. Why are the authorities in this country taking away the responsibility of people to make decisions for themselves? It is happening everywhere. I think he speaks for a lot of the nation there. Anthony says, prohibition never works. You're just creating a market for organised crime to exploit. A point that Benedict has been making. And Sandra says, no, nope, you should always have freedom of choice, even the bad choices. And where does it end? What will be next? We're becoming a dictator state. Uh, you've also been uh, on the phones. Keep those calls coming in. Let's go to Leo in West London. Not Leo Varadka, I hope, because he's busy doing other things, still being prime minister. No, definitely not. I'm on the other side of the ocean. Lovely. <laughs> the, the, or as Donald, uh, well, that's how to see, as Donald Trump would call it, a beautiful ocean, a beautiful ocean. Leo, what do you make of this ban? I'm a bit split. I've been a smoker for 40 years and I hate it. it it's cost me money, it, it's, you know, it's inconvenient and um, I've always thought the best way to not do something is to not start it at all. Giving yep. up is a pretty tough, hard thing. Yeah. However, I'm completely split because I don't trust the government. There will be so much nanny state, there will yeah. be government overreach and the usual mission creep. I think Benedict yeah. mentioned it beforehand. If uh, one policy goes through, it will be used as a permission to further yeah. other agendas. And, and, and especially the idea that when you have, you know, you can have a 27-year-old um, being able to buy cigarettes and a 26-and-a-half-year-old yeah. not, and then everyone goes, this is ridiculous. And then, what a surprise, they'll say, oh, well, we'll ban it for everybody. Because yeah, every it time, be. they, it's always a slippery slope. But it's not even a slippery slope. I mean, it's like a steep cliff now, isn't it, on the It is. Day? And then there's the other incidentals, like somebody else mentioned beforehand, the tax. No yeah. government's just going to give up tax. It's going to be taxed somewhere else, isn't it? Yeah. They're, they're going to reclaim it from somewhere else. Yeah, because so. eventually, if the idea is, if it's successful, as in fewer people smoke, they're not going to get that money from that. Do you worry that it'll be alcohol next? It'll be sugar? It'll be cakes? I think, as, as Benedict said earlier, it'll be mission creep. If this is successful, they'll you know, they'll use it for you know excuse for do something else with yeah. as well. So we know they like yeah. controlling us and wagging their <laughs> fingers at us, don't they? Anyway, yeah. really good to hear from you, Leo. Thank you so much indeed. Uh, coming up after the break, we're going to be talking more about that major security breach for the Princess of Wales after reports that staff at her private hospital tried to gain unauthorized access to her medical records. I'm Julia Hartibra. You're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And you're on your smart speaker.
Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to it was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brew, and you're with Talk TV. Now let's go back to that uh, breaking news uh, today with that story about Kate and the uh, major security breach being investigated by the Data Watchdog as uh, a breach of the Princess of Wales's health records. It appears that staff at her private hospital in London tried to gain unauthorised access to those records while she was in uh, hospital. 13 days that she spent there after abdominal surgery and then, of course, recovering ever since. This comes as new polling shows that over half of the British public have seen conspiracy theories about her health. Well, joining me now to discuss this is former head of Royal Security, Di Davies. Uh, good afternoon to you, Di. Hey, good afternoon Thanks to you. Thanks for joining us. When we think of Royal Security, we largely think about preventing people from, you know, getting, you know, terrorists getting to the royal family uh, or, uh, or, uh, or protesters or some sort who could cause them an injury uh, or even sort of the sort of fans who are obsessed. Whereas actually, I suppose nowadays it also includes cyber security, these sort of health records, one of the reasons why we understand the royals use uh, this hospital, the London Clinic, and Amer former American presidents and others is because they've got very strict security and they believe that the confidentiality of their health records is, is safe. It would appear not. Well, yes, you're absolutely right. And, of course, uh, Russell Myers from The Mirror broke this last night, as I understand it, and he's the royal editor, and clearly uh, somebody has revealed some of these allegations and at the moment all we know is that it is an allegation that somebody uh, alleged to be a member of staff actually tried or did get hold of the records that as far as i know uh, is all we know now clearly this is a breach of a 2018 act section 178 if everybody's interested where clearly it, it makes it illegal for anyone to try 
and get into personal records. I've experienced this myself as an expert witness giving evidence when, when my details were revealed to a third party. It is horrible. Yeah. And if this is true, then clearly whoever are behind it, whatever their motives are, they should be dealt with by the police, not oh, the absolutely. data commissioner. absolutely. I mean, it's an outrageous uh, breach of trust. It's an outrageous... I mean, even for, you know, anyone, anyone just, you know, ordinary, you know, people like me, just, you know, the idea that someone could get into your medical records and could divulge them to someone. The question is, oh, the motivation, was it just sort of, you know, interest, nosiness, again, still absolutely unacceptable, or were they planning to sell that information to a third party? I imagine there is huge amounts of money swirling around trying to get information about what's happened uh, to uh, Kate because of the lack of information from the palace, which I think is perfectly justified. She's entitled to her uh, her medical privacy. But we know unscrupulous uh, you know, websites and, and, and uh, the paparazzi types around the world would want to get a hold of that information, even though, of course, the British media wouldn't be allowed to go anywhere near it, and quite rightly. Well, again, you're right. And, and uh, speaking for I, I wish people would just leave the princess alone. Yeah. Um, and, and to a degree, stop giving these lunatics the airtime uh, to be discussing it. Well, no, we I, have I, a I clear, often think uh, that, Di, when we're discussing, I think, are we just making it worse? And everyone going on telly saying, stop discussing it. But, but this is all over social media. You must have had calls. I've had calls. Anyone who thinks someone might know something they're not allowed to divulge in public, what's really going on? But... The palace said she's going into hospital, pre-planned abdominal surgery. She will be staying in hospital for two weeks and then she will not be back until after Easter on public duties. Nothing has changed. No, again, you're absolutely right. And I, I did ponder whether I should add to it just by coming on, but at least <laughs> I can give some clarity that, yes, this should be investigated, in my opinion, by the police. It is an, an offence if somebody's tried to do this and particularly if they are in breach of any kind of trust. Now, we don't know uh, if the allegations are actually true. There must be a head of security there, yeah. and he or she must have the best advice possible to ensure that the systems are encrypted and that only people who have a legitimate medical reason can get into it. And therefore, I would hope there is an audit trail to catch the person if indeed it's true. Yeah, I mean, I can't believe that there isn't one, actually, that these sort of I these IT systems, and it would be somewhere like that, it would be uh, 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 on IT. I think that's always the worry, isn't it, about systems being, you know, uh, on computers, how much more easy they might be to access than, than a paper file that could be locked away. But we we've seen breaches even when there are paper files. In terms of what the palace does now, though, look, the, the King, King Charles was, was, was treated there for his prostate uh, uh, concerns um, before, of course, the announcement that he had a cancer, um, which we don't know what kind of cancer yet. So, you know, and other very, other very, you know, VIP figures have been treated there as well. This will raise concerns about is there anywhere that is private and safe for these sorts of people to, to have health treatment? Well, again, uh, it goes back to 2012 when two uh, individuals managed to persuade a nurse and tragically. Um, when it was disclosed, she took her own life. Uh, I don't know. I'm not a technical expert in any shape or form. You would hope there are contingency plans. You would hope, knowing that modern-day hackers can get in, that the finer systems are employed, particularly in a private, expensive hospital like this, because reputation, be it Royals or the medical centre, are absolutely crucial. You have to have confidence in both in one sense. But you know, the job of the police is not to, uh, only to personally protect them, but protect reputation. And, and I think in yeah. some respects, I'm not sure the Palace and Kensington have been that good in, in actually dealing with all I of this. I agree with you on that. And putting it to bed in one shape or I, another. Absolutely. I think they probably uh, fueled a lot of this by, by remaining silent a lot of the time. Di Davies, former head of Royal Security, thank you so much for joining us. Quick 10 seconds to Benedict. I agree. Then. It's a brave new world of social media and it seems that the palace is not quite caught up with the, what protocols are the right thing to do in this sort of and situation. And how to get ahead of these sort exactly. of stories, indeed. Uh, really appreciate you joining us all uh, today at Benedict Spence. Thank you very much indeed. Sadly, we have come to the end of this show. Thank you so much for tuning in. Please do join me same time tomorrow. Up next, it's Kevin O'Sullivan and Alex Phillips. Have a great afternoon. I'm Julia Hartley-Brewer and you're with Talk TV.
Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And you're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat, oh. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, a trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from King City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen! <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. 